morning. The time is now 9.33 and a quorum of the board is present. The State Board of Education meeting of February 11, 2020 is called to order. Morning, First know. item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda and order of priority. Are there any items board members would like to add or delete from the agenda? Hearing none, may I please have a motion to approve the agenda? Approve. Motion to approve by Mr. McMillan. Second? Right. Second by Ms. Fecto. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, all opposed? The ayes, uh, desultory as they may have been, have it. At this time, Marilyn will introduce the members of the State Board of Education. Good morning. I'm Marilyn Schneider. I'm the State Board Executive, and you've just been listening to the State Superintendent, Dr. Michael Rice, who also serves as Chair of the State Board of Education. And as we go around the table to the left, the President of the Board is Dr. Cassandra Albrich, and she lives in Dearborn. Next to her, Dr. Pamela Pugh is the board's vice president. She lives in Saginaw. She'll be here momentarily. The board secretary is Michelle Fecto. She lives in Detroit. Next to her is board member Nikki Snyder. Next to her is board member Tiffany Tilly. She's the board's association delegate, National Association of State Boards of Education. We call it NASB. Next to her is this year's Michigan Teacher of the Year, from Rochester Community Schools, Carol Lougheed. And across the table, representing the governor's office, is Brandy Johnson. She is the policy advisor for post-secondary education and workforce development. Next to her, board member Judy Pritchett. And then the other seat at the table here is Lupe Ramos-Montini. Um, oh, and I should back up. Judy is from Oakland Township, Dr. Pritchett. No, I am. Oh, no, you are. He is. Washington <laughs> Township. See, I get out of sync. And <laughs> I appreciate the help <laughs> and the corrections. Um, and then next to her is board member Lupe Ramos-Montini, who's on the way. She's from Grand Rapids. From Oakland Township is the board's treasurer, Mr. Tom McMillan. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, Ms. Sheila Alice, would you please begin the introduction of new employees? Thank you, Dr. Rice. I would be uh, honored to do that. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, it is my honor this morning to introduce Dr. Eleanor Harris. Dr. Uh, Harris is joining us from uh, as a consultant within the Office of Partnership Districts. Now, what's interesting is that Eleanor, it, while she is a new hire and a new employee in the department, is not new to the department. Um, she was with us from 28 to 2015 as the assistant director of the Office of Special Education and then as the director of the Office of Special Education. So she is returning to the department. And Eleanor, would you care to share a little bit about what you've been doing since you left the department in 2015 and then coming back next? Good morning. When I left the department, actually, I uh, was the... until the uh, EAA closed. And then as an independent contractor, I supported the Detroit Public School District and a compliance coordinator. I was in that position for almost um, It's nice to be able to uh, now focus on results because when most people see me, they think special education and they think compliance. And so it'll be interesting to be in a different arena. Um, I've probably worked in every district in here. <laughs> or at least visited every district in here, spent 18 years in every district. Pleasure to be back, and for those faces that are familiar, I want to let you know for the record that you all look younger. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kyle Garant. Yes, it's my pleasure to introduce Emily Mattern, uh, a new team member in our Office of Health and Nutrition Services. Hi, um, as Kyle said, my name is Emily Mattern. and also training food service director. I've worked in and around child nutrition programs my whole Director started in West Ottawa, public schools in Holland. From all angles, and I'm very excited to be the state agency. Thank you very much. Dr. Scott Kennickschneck. Morning, all. I have two new employees that I'd like to introduce to you this morning. The first is Tori Ranish from the Office of Special Education, and I ask Tori to say a few words. I'm 
I'm in the monitoring and technical assistance team. And um, I'm taking on um, uh, and look at um, adult learning and how we can expand that as um, we're um, prior to taking on this role, I was a uh, teacher in um, Lincoln Consolidated School. Uh, I was a special education teacher, and I got my master's from Michigan State University um, in uh, K-12 administration. Welcome, Tori. Uh, another new employee is Kelly Vogating, and she is with the Office of Great Stars. Okay. Also helped assist with the fresh, so that we could get a fresh group of folks. Okay. Thank you, Tyler. Um, and finally, Dr. Vanessa Kiesler. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I am very pleased to introduce Katie Petrowski, uh, who is new in the Office of Educational Supports. Katie, can you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Hello, I'm Katie. I'm originally from Southern California and moved to the great state of Michigan to become a teacher. And I spent the majority of the last 15 years teaching And now I'm here as a literacy consultant and beyond excited to be here. So thank you. And as a point of interest, Katie and I, <laughs> Katie taught in Corona, which is my alma mater. So yeah. we really like to recruit from Corona here at the department. Great <laughs> <laughs> <Any> connection. <clears throat> uh, did we miss any new employees in the room? Seeing none, thank you uh, to our new employees, and in one case to our uh, former and now renew employees, um, and welcome. Um, if you plan to offer public comment today, please complete a form and get it to Maryland. Forms are available on the table just outside the boardroom and must be submitted prior to the beginning of the portion of the meeting devoted to public comment. Public comment will begin immediately following the lunch break at approximately 1 p.m. today. Please be here at that time to ensure you have an opportunity to provide comment. The first item on the committee, the whole agenda, is presentation by students from Innovation Academy in Howell Public Schools. In keeping with our tradition to hear from students, we welcome our presenters from Innovation Academy. This presentation is informational and requires no board action. Here to present to us are Mr. Connor Nabb, a 12th grade student at Innovation Academy. Ms. Michaela Kramp, Kramp um, a 10th grade student at Innovation Academy. Ms. Dawn Webster, a teacher at Innovation Academy. Mr. Jay McDowell, also a teacher at Innovation Academy. Mr. John Lagallo, the principal from Innovation Academy. And where there is a school, there must be a superintendent. Mr. Aaron McGregor, superintendent of Howell Public Schools. Please join us. Thank you. I'm just going to take a minute. Thank you very much for having us. I'm going to have my team get seated. There's five seats and six of us, and clearly I should take a back seat to this. So <laughs> I'm going to let them get seated. Um, again, I just want to thank Dr. Rice, the members of the Board of Education, for providing us an opportunity to share a little bit about our story of Innovation Academy. Thank you to Dr. Kiesler for her visit to the district to kind of shed some light on what we're doing. Um, I'm just going to frame up one minute in terms of how we got to, to where we're at today. Uh, again, I'm Aaron McGregor, Superintendent of Howell Schools. End of my first year in the district, um, I was at a student disciplinary committee meeting. And um, listening to the story of the student at that committee uh, kind of broke my heart in the sense of I felt like we had a system that, that did not, that failed this kid. And, and we didn't reach this kid the way I felt like we could have reached him. And so that launched in a conversation with my <coughs> board of education uh, to create a different environment, a different experience for some of our kiddos. Um, we have a comprehensive high school of about 2,200 students, and um, it provides some amazing opportunities for our kids. Um, I think state-of-the-art opportunities for our kids. It also wasn't addressing all the needs of our kids. And so it, we were able to launch into a conversation, if you could just fast forward one slide, um, to provide um, a more innovative experience, a more hands-on experience, a more personalized experience for our kids. Um, you know, some of, some of you might see, 
Innovation Academy as an alternative uh, high school, um, I would be proud to say that I think we took a much different spin on what a normal alternative high school might offer kids. Um, and so again, I want to give credit to my Board of Education because in a, in a time where budgets are very tight, I asked them to take a risk and invest some things into a school um, that we probably didn't quite have the resources for at the time, but knowing that if we, if we made the right investment, we were going to uh, do well for kids. Um, so again, uh, I think some of the things that set us apart that you're going to hear about is uh, we were able to attract a group of educators that were highly motivated highly skilled and truly cared about kids. And so to launch that experience with them, I basically just said, here's some time and space, you guys go and create. And I think if there's a message from me to the board about making sure teachers have time and space, it's just really important because we have fabulous educators in the state and they can create some really great things if we can provide the time for them. So uh, that's what we were able to do. Uh, we kind of went into the design mode for the better part of a year. And then we were open the school last year. Uh, fortunately, uh, we were we ended last year with uh, graduating 42 students from Innovation Academy. We're on track this year to, to do the same. So with that said, appreciate the opportunity to be in front of you today. I'm going to hand it off to, to my awesome team and start out with Jay McDowell, teacher at Innovation Academy. Yeah. You can have that seat right there if you like. <laughs> thank you. Good, good morning. Thank you for having us. Uh, Connor and I were just talking about, you know, what a joy it was. I asked him, in seventh grade, did you think you would be making a presentation on the State Board of Education as a senior in high school? And, of course, the answer was no. And so this is just a wonderful that, that you want to listen to, to students from a, a small school in a, in, a, in a small place. One of the first things we looked at when we looked at students and students that might go into an alternative high school is of course Maslow. And the idea that stu if students are not ready to learn, and I know this is something that's said throughout education, if students are not ready to learn, then they're not going to learn. The problem is, is that traditional high schools, although we say a student needs to be ready to learn in order to learn, <coughs> We, we don't have the practices to really make sure the student is ready. The structures of traditional schools don't necessarily provide that. So one of the first things we did was to say, let's structure our school so that we can provide for those things that Maslow talks about. We have a food pantry where students can get food at any time. Um, they can eat whenever they want. They can eat anywhere in the school. Um, whenever they are hungry, they can go and get that. And we work with gleaners to stock that food pantry. And it's not just for students, but also for their families and for the community. Uh, we provide just an inordinate amount of time. I guess you should back up. Clear your mind of what you think high school is, because that's what we did when we started Innovation Academy. We don't have classes. We don't have bells. We don't have classrooms. Um, none of that that exists in a traditional classroom do we necessarily have. We've taken out grades, as you'll see in a later slide, and, and we just speak to the standards. So we speak to the Michigan Merit Curriculum. We've reduced that to the standards that are in that so that students earn standards. They don't earn grades. They don't earn credits. They pass standards. They go to proficiency or mastery in those standards. So if a student comes to school and they're not ready to learn, they need to eat. Well, the first thing they do is eat. If they need to spend some time with friends in order to get that feeling of belonging and self-esteem, they can do that. If they need to sit and talk with a mentor for 15, 20 minutes, they can do that. Um, we, are, we are radically student-centered. So if a student is ready to work and they come in and they say, I'm ready to get going on my standards, <coughs> then we sit down with them and we start working on the educational stuff. If they come to school and it takes them an hour or an hour and a half to get ready to learn, they have that hour or that hour and a half. They, they're not going to be marked absent in a first hour class. They're not going to have to listen to the bells and try and remember where they need to go. They get what they need emotionally, socially, psychologically, and, and also food-wise before, before they have to learn. And if they start and they work with us for an hour and then they need to take a break, they can do that. Again, if they're not moved along by a traditional schedule. Um, and the fact that we're small, we're just 120 students, and that we have uh, six really excellent mentors allows us to provide that social-emotional spot for them um, that really a traditional school can't. Um, and, and Connor's one of our, one of our star students that, uh, that, that came to us and, and really needed some time to, to get his feet wet, um, to get 
I don't know, and I'll, I'll pass it to you in just a second, but, but to trust adults again. A lot of our students come to us, they don't trust adults, they don't trust the community. Both of those you know, groups have failed them. And so some of the first things we have to do as mentors in Innovation Academies is recreate that trust, bring that trust about, yes, you can trust adults, yes, you can trust this community, and now we're, we're ready to learn. We're ready to, to get to proficiency or mastery on those standards. Um, so that, that's the story of many of our students, uh, but Connor's here to, to tell his story. Oh, wrong one. Oh, Michaela, I'm sorry, we'll start with Michaela. Ah, yeah, I get all, I get all confused. Um, so when I first started, I would have never been able to like come in and talk to so many people at once. I could barely even talk, you know, one-on-one -on -one with uh, the mentors, and it, being in a setting like this has really helped me grow and just become more confident and social and being able to just, um, even just be my own, I guess. Um, there's been so many opportunities given to me that I would have never had before. Like, I've been able to like volunteer at different, like, you know, Love blood drive. I've been able to um, do different activities. Like we've done Legion Fire. It's basically like a group to talk about emotions, routines, and just really get people to open their minds. And um, we've done Michigan Student Caucus, where it's um, a group we can make proposals and talk about different things happening in Michigan and just like problem solving. And um, Sorry. You're fine. You're doing great. What are you doing now at LCC? Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so I just started doing enrolling at Lansing Community College. I've got two classes I'm working with right now. I've been doing that for the past couple of weeks. And it's fantastic that I get the opportunity to do that. And um, I'm so glad that. that my mentors have helped me get to that spot, and they're helping me get through the classes, and I'm, it's, it's amazing. Um, and um, I'm in a karate class, and it's helped me, it's put me in a community that I can now like expand with, and it gives me something I can uh, work with and just carry on me with the rest of my life that I can just, you know, have people that I know and I can go to and sorry, um, and then with that, uh, all the mentors have been amazing. They really helped me, like, move on with, uh, in school and stuff because it, it was really hard for me to work with like so many people at once, but having that one-on-one -on -one is just really great. Um, Thank you. It, one of the things we look at with also, the students aren't locked into this traditional schedule of bell, 45 minutes, bell, 45 minutes, but teachers aren't locked into that either. So when Michaela came to us uh, over Christmas break, she had decided that she was ready for dual enrollment, that she wanted to do this, brought that to us with about three or four days left before the deadline to get that all signed up. But because I'm not locked into six classes that I have to teach 190 students, and neither is Dawn, we were able to then take that, contact LCC, work through all the paperwork, and get that all done and get her enrolled, and off she goes for dual enrollment. So we weren't, we didn't miss an opportunity uh, for what Michaela wanted because we were stuck in a different structure. We were able to, to look at what she wanted and, and really be able to help her with that. And now she's got two classes at LCC, which is awesome. Uh, great. This is you, but this you, is me. But I mean, you kind of touched on this already. And, and I'm, I'm John, and I'm the principal. And, and so we really have kind of created a, a culture where we, we make it, you know, welcoming for students to come in. Uh, and we really create that culture, and that, I, and I'm going to be honest, that really comes from Aaron's leadership and then these teachers. I'm just a big proponent in the power of teachers, and teachers make the difference. 
And it's teachers like this that come in and help build this culture with the students like, like Connor and Michaela. And I cannot tell you how proud I am of these two and how much they have grown. And you see Michaela's growth and, and how powerful she, she's become. And it's because mentors like this are willing to go the distance to, to help them in whatever it is that they need. So we as a, as a teen center, we really do focus on what it is that they need to succeed. And we build those relationships and they're real. And it's, it's not phony, it's not fake, it is genuine, and, and it is based on, on true caring. And these, these mentors to show that every day, and that's why we get to work with the kids and, and take a different approach. And we do have schools that come through and tour all the time. We had another one just, just come through yesterday, and uh, we have superintendents and districts that come through. And the one thing that they say over and over is that this is the first alternative school that feels alternative that looks alternative. And, and that's because of the creativity that these teachers have put in. And then the freedom, like Mr. McGregor, has allowed us to fail and move forward. You know, we've made a lot of mistakes in, in, our, in our year and a half, but we've learned and, and picked ourselves up and keep moving forward. And so it's been just a lot of fun to come in every day to be with Michaela. And Connor's got a great story, too. And with that teen center concept, we have, we have, we've got a basketball court, we've got weightlifting. And again, the, the students aren't in set in a set structure. So if a student comes in and they, the morning was rough, it was tough at home, and then it was tough getting into school, if they need to play basketball for an hour before they get started you know, working on academics, they can go play basketball. We also have Nintendo Switch, we've got the Oculus Quest. Um, we've got various ways for students to kind of engage with each other get that social emotional with peers uh, out of the way and get themselves settled into the day so that they can learn or they can learn first and then take a break, go play basketball for 45 minutes and then come back. So I think that um, the biggest switch that I see coming from before at a, at a seven hour day traditional classroom um, in terms of building stamina is the, it's more of an outward mindset um, I think that we all have care about our students and we want to make sure they're getting what they need. Um, but it becomes a little bit overwhelming when there's that many students coming through the, the room. Um, or you're, you come in for the day and think, I have these objectives. The students will be able to. Da, 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 da. Where here, I really feel like I walk in and I'm like, okay, I know which standards the students need but I don't know exactly the path it's going to take. I do come prepared. I have activities that I'll bring. Um, but you join their journey and then dig for the standards that way. So I find that's very different. I mean, because we'll walk in, we are kind of one of our jokes that we have as mentors is like, well, I came in planning to do this, this, and this, <laughs> and my day didn't turn out anything like that, you know? So, um, but I think that's the part that makes it so radically student-centered is that we're, we really do need to know what the students need to have done to graduate, but how we get there is always going to be very different than maybe we planned. Um, and so it might mean that uh, I, I'm in, a, in the coffee shop listening to students talk and I realize they're just talking about how they just created these amazing Dungeons and Dragons characters. Well, those are standard. That's, that's character development. That's rhetorical analysis. I mean, th there are some things that they're doing in that that I can use. And so in terms of building the academic stamina, it might start out as uh, emotional stamina. It might start out as um, mental stamina, being able to play with us um, for a, an extended period of time. But it's also then showing them that you might actually like learning, you just don't know it. Or you like to read, you just don't know it because I haven't assigned you to read, you know, the Scarlet Letter or something. Um, and so we had a student that we've been working with uh, for history and she does a project. I hate history. I'm like, are you sure? You hate, even after learning about it, you hate it. Yep, hate everything about it. But she's done, what, eight or ten projects now. And we said, how do you feel about history? And she's like, well, I really like it. I, I actually like it. I didn't know I liked it. So I think it's the structure of being able to kind of explore, and then they start to realize, oh, I do like to do, I like to explore my world and be inquisitive. And so I think the last part after joining their journey is to make sure you're celebrating their progress, and you have to articulate that to them, because they don't know that they're doing it. Like, you just sat and played chess with me for 25 minutes. That was really good. That takes a lot of concentration. Or you just spent all this time leading this Dungeons and Dragons campaign, or... You know, but that helps, I think, them to build that, that kind of ties into the Maslow's um, hierarchy where they're building their self-confidence. So I think then you start building in more and more academics and they don't even feel like they're 
studying, you know. And then the next thing you know, they can actually do stuff they don't like, right. you know. So I think that that, for me, is the path I see. And, and again, I, I know we can talk about this school for hours, and I know we got 15 minutes, and so we'll go very quickly. But I think, again, one of our strengths is that we really focus on each individual kid because they all have different passions. They all, they all learn different. They have different strengths. And we try to focus on what those strengths are. And so we really get to know each kid and create a plan for them to be successful throughout life. And so it looks totally different for each kid. So we really do have 125 IEPs in a way because everybody has a different, you know, goal. And so that really is, is the strength of, of our success is, is that individualization. And again, it takes great teachers to be able to pull that off. And it, it takes changing the mindset a little bit. We, you know, we will assign, if you want to say assign, you know, students. In our dream world, students come to us with their projects already fully developed in their minds and they're ready to go, but that, that's not the real world. So they'll come and they say, well, what can I do? What can I do to learn about the civil rights? What can I do to, to learn about ancient Rome? And we might give them a project to start. There's no due date. I mean, this is at their pace, at, you know, when they can get it done, they take their time and move forward with it. They can also come back to us a weekend and go, yeah, this just isn't doing it for me. Um, can I do something else? And we're like, yeah. And we just abandon that. And then we move, why don't you try, try this over here? Perhaps this will be more interesting. Because again, we're building that academic stamina, but also meeting them where they're at each yes. day so that we say, yeah, if my idea of what's fun about ancient Rome is not your idea, then you don't have to do my idea. We're going to do your idea, and, and you tell us if it's working. So there's a lot of giving them agency. I mean, a lot of students that come to alternative schools don't have agency, and so one of our main focuses every day is providing more and more agency to the, to the student. So, and, and again, I, and, and I will let Connor talk about this, but we really find what they're interested in and their passions. Like, uh, we found out somebody really likes drones, and so we kind of then created a lot of science and math projects around drones. You want to kind of share your story, Connor? Um, so up at the beginning of elementary school all the way through high school, I was really shy and didn't want to talk to anyone. Um, but going through this school helped, has helped me get comfortable with, with talking to people, trusting them. Um, be, being able to make new friends because last year at the beginning of school I was afraid that I wasn't going to make any new friends. I was nervous. I was shy, but but when we when I first walked in that that um, door, people were greeting me, you know, and they and then Pua came up to me and said, "Hey, do you want to help me build a a, a grill?" So we mm -hmm. built that grill that one day and had a cookout that day. <laughs> so that got that got me confident that. Um, that I can talk to someone and ask them if I can do something. What are some of your favorite projects you've done in, in the last year and a half? Um, the favorite things I like to do is um, at the beginning of this year, we finally got to uh, really work on drones. So we, we built drones, we flew drones, we went to a golf course and did videos and took pictures of a golf course. Um, to help them promote their their, uh, their golf course. And I've also teaching students how to build drones and fly them and, and how to problem solve, you know, what to do if you broke them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we also started working on this electric go-kart for a competition in May. Uh, this is our, this is the pub, is it the, Square one IBD. Yeah, uh, we're the first school in this area to do this competition. So this is like a really good uh, honor to be in this competition and build this car, solve problem, solve, fix things, learn new things. And this is something I always wanted to do: was is, uh, build something, work on something, uh, figuring things out, problem solve. Uh, we're, 
now that, now that you've got this new confidence and, and you've been able to do these projects, where, where are you headed in the fall? Um, I was afraid that I wasn't going to be able to graduate this year or graduate at all. So, but this year I know I'm going to graduate. I'm doing pretty good. And I did, I did get accepted into um, MIAT College for Airplane Engineering. Very proud of that. Very, very excited about that. Yeah, we, we're part of the, the Square One Education Foundation IVD Challenge. And so we're building this electric uh, go-kart from scratch. And that's in, that has brought out in other students, you know, in Connor and in some other students that weren't quite sure what they wanted to do with their education, that has given them a focus and an excitement uh, to come to school every day and, and to get to work on that. And really the, the onus on us is to find the standards in what the students want to do. So instead of the students doing what we want them to do and we say, ah, good, you did 70% of this thing that I asked you to do, instead we find out what the students want to do, we go and look at the standards and say, okay, yeah, we can, we can morph this just a little bit and now you're getting this standard and this standard and this standard. Um, so we really try to focus on, on those things. Um, and with that, standards really are king. Um, I've taught for over 20 years and this is the first place I've been where standards were the main focus, and really realize that the grades don't tell us anything about what a, what a student has learned. Um, especially an F tells us nothing about what the student has learned, because as we try to take students, uh, you know, transcripts from other schools, and we see they had an F in world history, and I want to be able to give them some standards for what they might have learned, that F on the transcript tells me nothing. I have no clue what that kid knows and does not know. Um, so, you know, we really focus on making sure that everything's broken down into standards that the students understand and as they go through the school, they understand what the standards are, what standards they need to accomplish. And they'll even come to us and say, can I get history standards for this? Can I get uh, government standards for this? I turned to Connor and I said, you're going to get some government standards for being here at a government function and seeing how this works and Robert's rules of orders and, and all of that kind of stuff. So it really puts the onus on us as the educators to look at what are the students' passions and then find the standards within that so that they can then move forward in, in their educational journey. Thank you. Thank you. I know we've exceeded our time limit. I, I'm Very sorry. much appreciated. No, but you, we get, you know we get excited. It, it, uh, <laughs> it was pretty riveting in a whole host of different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, board members, questions or comments? Mr. McMillan? I've got a ton. And, Dr. <laughs> and I know we don't have enough time. Uh, quickly, just a yes or no. Or is, are you guys familiar with Dinter Smith's Most Likely to Succeed film? As far as, okay, because it really sounds a lot like this, what he advocates or what that, that film is about. Um, yeah, I've got seven or eight, so I don't know how to <laughs> pare these down, but uh, I'll just list them off and I'll let you decide which ones. Uh, what about standards students don't like, aren't interested in? Where do you find these teachers? Uh, <laughs> Heaven. What about fix it? You know, I'm glad that you're not, I got to do Young Zhao at least to say one thing about him. So you're not fixing deficiencies as much as strengthening interests and passions, which yes. are incredible. That's what I've talked a lot about. Uh, what about age appropriate standards? Do you find some that you like? kind of want to push off to another year? What about state testing? Um, how difficult is it to do individual instruction? I mean, yeah, I, I, I've thought that this was not really that possible because you've got, you're juggling so many, well, you can't standardize a classroom. So you, you yes. can't, so I, I think all the, so take whatever, if you can answer one or <laughs> well, two of I those. Think, I think the one that you talk about, like, you know, passion and, and those standards, uh, we then work with those kids and like, how can we, here are the standards, so how would you, what, how do you learn best and what are going to pique those interests? So we really try to like stoke those fires. But you can do that to each child, we, each student? But that, it takes a lot of time. Right. That's what, that's why I'm saying like, you know, a big part of what we do, by the way, too, and this is something we just didn't go into, uh, but through the seat time waiver and, and everything that, that we, we don't have Wednesdays with the kids. And by the way, we have a lot of anxiety kids and that's been very helpful where it's like, give us two good days, you get a day off. So on these Wednesdays, that is not like a day off for the teachers. We are spending our time like going through like, hey, how can I reach this kid? What are some other projects and bouncing things off that I can make this interesting? How can we get, 
you know, uh, uh, Michaela to, to be more interested in this Algebra 2 standard? How can we get, count, like, we, we sit and we talk about that and it's heavy lifting. Yeah. Mr. Legallo, you yes. mentioned a seat time waiver. Why yeah. don't you explain, yeah, explain that to, uh, to people and share where you got that? Thank you. And that, that we get, we, we apply for that through the MDE every year. And what that allows us to do is that we have to, we don't, aren't in school 180 days. We are in school for, uh, I believe it's a hundred, I think we, it's a minimum 142, I think we're at 146, and our number of hours is reduced. And a part of that is a huge part of our success and what you guys allow us to do with that. We would not have the success if we were still under the, hey, you have to be here 180 days and you have to keep them here for, for a certain amount of time because we are flexible and are able, are able to be flexible with our students' needs. Whether some of those kids also, and it's not just like the complete number of days with their academic success, but it's also within the day where we have some kids who have needs where they have to stay home and like do care daycare, and then when they take care of that, then they come to us, and then they're there for you know five six hours. But it's not confined to I have to be here at seven fifteen. I have to be out at two. We open our doors at seven thirty. We close at four. So we work within each kit, and it's the same thing the other way too. We have kids that need to work and make money for their homes. So they come in and they do their hours and they get their stuff and they take care of it. And now that they see that there are adults and, and educators that, that really do care about their needs and, and, and about those things. And so that seat time waiver, if, it, if we didn't mm. operate with that, we would have no success. You guys are a big, huge part of why we're able to have some of the success that we have or a lot of the success. We appreciate the flexibility that you've crafted to serve your, your children. Dr. Pugh? So I guess just um, following up on some of the things that um, Tom has brought up, well, first of all, thank you all for your presentation. Mm -hmm. That was excellent, and thank the department for bringing, them, bringing you all here. Um, some of the things that you're raising, I mean, we're, uh, the conversation couldn't be more timely. We're mm -hmm. talking about schools where we're talking about closures of schools, cramming more kids into buildings because we don't have enough students in buildings. Um, but you're making the case for something that a lot of my uh, friends who are educators say, you know, sometimes it, obviously the lower numbers give us an opportunity to concentrate on children and um, again, their abilities uh, that, that may be unique. Um, so I guess one of the things, and this is probably more for the department, and you might have answered this, but how are we looking at this model and may, maybe looking at, um, I know we're applying implementation science um, to some programming here at the state level, but how are we looking to see how we can sustain, spread, scale, um, and uh, this, this model beyond alternative education? And, and can you repeat again your numbers, your number of students? We're, we're, at, number of we're at 125, um, you know, and, and that's, that's where we're at. We, we do have... Uh, a number of, of families and, and people who, who, who want to get in. We've just learned, like, we, we will get to them as well, but we've got to get these our kids through uh, because each kid is so much heavy lifting. There, there is that balance, you know, and we do want to save and work with so many kids, but we gotta, we got to do what we do. So our numbers is, are at 125 right now, and that's, you know, we do have six full-time teachers and then myself, and we do have, uh, we do have a, a youth counselor that is really important to the school and the culture. It's not a school counselor, we have a youth counselor. So that way, it's purposely designed that way, so that way she's a little bit more freedom and, and ad lib to deal with some of those emotional needs than, you know, like, like a school counselor's equipped to. I, I don't know if I feel like I answered your question. The, the other, go. No, I'm sorry, just one thing I just wanted to mention was, um, as we've created, the things that keep me up at night are, you know, we've created this unbelievable opportunity for kids, and I think it is truly unique, but why does it have to be unique is, is the things that I right. tend right. to have to, like right. I don't sleep well at night because I, I feel like what I want to give credit to these guys for is it started a conversation in our district mm -hmm. about what are they doing there right. to then start to spur those yes. things. So we right. planted a seed for sure that's going to grow into other areas. We commended it as well as your board as you mentioned. And I guess my other question is, is for Vanessa, are we able to measure this in a way to determine if it Are we, what is it? 
Are we able to what? Measure elsewhere. Measure. Measure to see if it is something that could be applied elsewhere. I can open up a That's big conversation. Let's go into our next. It is a. It is a. It is a. It is a big conversation, and um, it's a. Um, it's a conversation not simply about um, how do you move from alternative to alternative, but how do you reduce anonymity in large schools across the across the state. It was actually a major initiative of the Gates Foundation for a number of years. They studied this hard over a period of time. And uh, there is research from Gates on this uh, subject. Ms. Snyder? I, I'm sure it probably has a lot to do with creating relationship. I mean, without relationship, you guys talked yes. about relationship a handful of times in all three of you. Um, but I just wanted to uh, mention to Michaela, I mean, I heard quite a few things from your story. It, I mean, it was pretty, I mean, growth, confidence, social interaction, having a voice. Uh, opportunity, dual enrollment. Connor, you said you might not have graduated. I mean, it's kind of like a almost a lifeline, if you will, to some degree that um, you guys will carry this forward. When you say plant a seed, you'll be the ones to help grow it because you'll tell your story again and again and again. So thank you for sharing today. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Vecto? Yeah, and um, I want to echo all the accolades. So it's very nice and Glad to have you here, and it's nice to hear about different ideas. And um, so, I had some questions just about the the structuring of it. And forgive me if I miss something. And I'm asking, so you are um, authorized through the Howell School District? Yes. Okay. So I'm curious how you collaborate with that because, and how you sustain yourself financially, um, given you know the the needs and the funding Bless that's you. available. Um, I'm wondering, so maybe I should, but so I'm also wondering if you have IEPs, you have children yes. with IEPs, and yes. so um, I'm assuming you have kids with autism and yes. a whole spectrum of all different kinds of kids. And yes. so, so how, um, uh, if you're, if the kids are allowed to be on teams at the main high school, how, how differentiated are you from um, that? Just how do you coordinate and work together with the district? Yeah, that's, um, and I'm assuming the teachers are under the same union contract. As they are. Yeah, okay, that's awesome. They are, but they but they also had to waive, and that was a bit of a struggle too. But they also had to waive a lot of things to come over, mm -hmm. um, like their prep time and and those kind of things. So they they had to operate under you know an MOU okay. with certain things, and that is they they don't have a prep time uh, on on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. They don't like what they say is is absolutely right. Like there's they they Locked eat lunch in. with the kids. Um, that's why I'm saying this is a teacher. The, our success is the teachers, right. and that teacher mentality. And and so I, I just can't beat that drum enough. So in order to do that, though, then Wednesday becomes their prep time, right? Right. Uh, but the Wednesday is a lot of heavy lifting, right. you know. Right. So I mean, it kind of answers that question. As far as the high school, I am constantly meeting with the high school principal. He and I have an outstanding relationship. We we constantly meet. The high school does a very good job of identifying at-risk students and then filtering them to me, where then I make contact with those families and then we have a process of, you know, of, of entering, you know. Uh, Don and team do home visits. Um, so those are things that, yeah. again, shouldn't be out of the box, but they're yeah. in homes and talking to families and things. My husband worked in um, an alternative at his first teaching, oh. after he taught in a prison. <laughs> but he, he's had a very interesting teaching job. Um, but he loved his experience, and he loved the students um, that he worked with and the administrators. And, you know, unfortunately, with his district, they ended up closing it. And um, uh, this was years ago. And, but I, I think they um, pro provided what you're saying, this sense of community um, and, uh, you know, there's relationships in every school. Teachers are wonderful everywhere. But to have um, just that intensity of focus for I think kids who really need it. I yeah. apologize. I think there's intentional ways that I, that I try to take to make sure that IA has their own space, but that IA also has yes. a voice in the district. And so just last night we had students at the board meeting speaking to the board. That's and that, those, just those kinds of things are really important for our board to hear and our community right. hear. So it's not just the school over there. Um, well, everybody always talks about the summer slide. And if you only have 142 days or whatever, 
Is that an issue for you that having such a uh, It is and we've actually amount? talked about how we can expand into the summer as well. Program yes, we summer. that I think that's something we're we are passionate about. And I, I do want to because I know your time is valuable, you guys yeah. but please so I guarantee if you write any questions to that email, I I will respond back to all of you. Okay. I, I, I do, and, and I do, I, and I do have answers to your other questions too. I just want to say I love the idea of them having time to have um, coordination among all the teachers. I think that's really valuable. I want to I want to thank Connor and Michaela uh, <laughs> yeah. for their their presentations. I'd like to also thank uh, Ms. Webster, Mr. McDowell, Mr. Legallo, and Mr. McGregor. You uh, you knocked it out of the park. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next item on the Committee of the Whole Agenda is a presentation on Top 10 and 10 Strategic Education Plan. Thank you. This presentation is an update on the review process for the Top 10 and 10 Strategic Education Plan and overview of preliminary results from the Stakeholder Survey. This informational presentation is one in a series of presentations and here to present to us today, yesterday, and tomorrow. <laughs> Ms. Sheila Alice, our Chief Deputy Superintendent, and Ms. Kelly Siciliano Carter, our Director of Office of Strategic Planning and Implementation. Ladies, good morning. Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Rice. We are pleased this morning to have another opportunity to provide you with an update on the process to revise Michigan's current Top 10 and 10 Strategic Education Plan. Our agenda or our outcomes for our presentation include an overview of the timeline for the review process. We are going to share with you stakeholder survey results. We'll describe for you next steps in the review process and then we will turn the discussion to Dr. Rice um, for him to continue to engage with you in a discussion about um, the revised Top 10 and 10 plan. So in thinking about um, our timeline, just a reminder that our timeline includes a four-part process. The first process is to engage in interviews, and we did that from November to January. We engaged in two types of interviews. The first type of interview was a one-on-one -on -one interview, and we engaged uh, in one-on-one -on -one interviews with education partners as well as external stakeholders. We conducted 22 of those. Also one-on-one -on -one interviews were uh, conducted with each of the eight State Board of Education members. The other type of interview was a group interview. We used the group interview process for interviewing members of the Michigan Department of Education. And we had 262 of MDE staff members that engaged in the um, interviews. The interviews, the purpose of the interviews was to gather information on what might be included or what should be included in a revised top 10 and 10 plan. So the information that was gathered from the interviews, that information was then used to generate questions for the stakeholder survey. The stakeholder survey um, opened in January on the 9th and concluded on February 7th. And in just a moment, Mrs. Ciciliano Carter is going to share those results with you. The, uh, that, and the survey was the second part of the review process. The third part of the review process is to have conversations with the Board of Education each month during your Board of Education meeting. So you will see on your agenda each month, beginning in October of 2019 and uh, continuing through May of 2020, the top 10 and 10 uh, presentation. The fourth part of our process is to engage in focus groups. And we will begin the focus groups in March and wrap those up in April. The end result of this four-step process then is to bring to the State Board of Education a draft revised top 10 and 10 plan in late spring. So now I know that you are all eagerly waiting to hear about the stakeholder results and we have some fabulous news to share with you. I'm going to work when you tell me that okay. you are ready. Please. <laughs> All right, because this is really fabulous news. 
Thank you, Mrs. Alice, and thank you to the State Board of Education for the opportunity to share the top 10 survey results with you today. Uh, Mrs. Alice just mentioned when the survey opened, and it did just close last Friday, February 7th at 11.59 p.m. So I am excited to announce that we had nearly 12,000 people respond to the survey. We were hopeful for a large response, and we're very excited that we received one. So I'd like to take a moment and just thank anyone who filled out the survey and also thank our education partners and stakeholders, business leaders who helped to promote the survey as well. So we really greatly appreciate the, the assistance and the large um, push of the survey out to anyone and everyone. So who are the 12,000 individuals? On the slide you can see that there, um, there were provided 13 options, and we asked the participants to select the choice or choices that best represents them. So on the slide, you can see the 13 options, and you can see the percentages related to each of those. It doesn't add up to 100% because respondents could select as many choices as they thought applied to them. So let's move to the meat of the survey, and this is really about potential goals for the strategic plan. As Mrs. Alice mentioned, we used the interviews to help us build the information within the survey, and more specifically, it was the interviews in November through January that we asked about what goals should be included in a plan. And so what we did was we took that information, we looked for patterns, and based on that patterns, we put 16 potential goals within the survey for people to react to. So for the first question related to goals, we asked participants to indicate the level of importance for including a goal in an updated plan. There were five answer choices, which you can see on the slide. So here are the results of these um, 16 potential goals. On this slide, there's eight. On the next slide, there's eight. And this is indicating the level of importance for inclusion as a goal and the percent of participants who thought the goal was very important. So I'm showing you the, the very important option. And here it is um, ranked from highest to lowest. So here you're seeing the top eight. Okay, on the next slide, you're seeing the next eight. Again, this is the very important and what percent thought they were very important. I do want to point out that participants were given the opportunity to write in other goals. So if they didn't see a goal that they um, wanted to include, they could write in other goals and they actually could write in up to five other goals. So they did that. Actually, 5,145 people responded and to putting in um, a 11,338 other goals. So we're in the process of analyzing that data right now and looking to see if those writing goals were similar to the 16 potential goals that we had or if there were additional goals that also need to be considered. Next these are, we, were these anonymous? I've, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, next, we ask the question, um, reflecting on your answer from the questions above, which is the question related to the importance of a goal and then the, also the um, other goal, then rank the top five goals that, you should, that should be included in Michigan's strategic education plan. Now, I wanna, they could select their other goal as one of their top five, so that's important to note. So hi, here are the results of that question. What you can see on this slide and the next are the 16 potential goals and the percent of how they are ranked from highest to lowest. So you're seeing the top eight. Okay, and then on the next slide, you're seeing the next eight. Um, okay. Can I ask a question? How many in total did they have to choose from? Five. They no, I'm sorry. Uh, so these are the top eight, right? So they had 16 potential goals, and they could, if they had five write-ins, they potentially had 21. <coughs> Thank you. So next we asked about how many goals should be included in a strategic plan. Back one, Shane. Thank you. Sorry. Um, the options were 1 to 4, 5 to 8, 9 to 12, or 13 plus. It's pretty clear here that people would like to see less goals over more. Um, this doesn't sum to 100% because of rounding, just so you're aware. 
Okay, the next question is related to how many years the strategic plan should be in place. One, three, five, or ten. And by far, five was the choice of respondents. And then lastly, we provided an opportunity for individuals to just provide us a comment that they may have. Well, we received nearly 3,000 comments. So again, we're just starting to analyze what they um, presented to us. Um, and next, I'm going to turn it back to Mrs. Ellis. All right. Thank you, Kelly. So um, what are the next steps? We are going to continue our um, survey analysis, looking at the other goals as well as the comments. Um, that were provided. We will be back next month for a presentation to the State Board of Education. Um, and we will continue to engage the State Board in discussion and conversation about uh, goals and metrics for a revised top 10 plan. And then we will um, continue to plan for and engage in our focus groups that are scheduled to occur during March and April. Um, this concludes our presentation on uh, top 10 and 10. We appreciate the opportunity this month to share with you our timeline, the survey results, and next steps in the process, and turn the presentation now to Dr. Rice. Thank you, Ms. Alice. Uh, board members, reflections. Uh, President Olbrich, Vice President Pugh. So first of all, I'm really excited to see so many respondents. That's fantastic. Uh, and it's really exciting that people are so engaged in the process and that we have such an open process that allows people to be engaged. Mm -hmm. um, just out of curiosity, and this is something you can send to us later, you don't have to answer it now, but I would be interested to see what the other eight are that people did not rate very highly. Um, because I think you get as much information from what people don't think is of high value as what they do think. You may not have noticed it on the second slide down was the next eight. So I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. That was all of them. Oh, I'm sorry. I yeah. thought you just said this was the top eight and top there was an additional. Top eight and the next eight. Okay, so sorry. I misunderstood. The 16. Sorry Got in it. the way that I. Dr. Pugh. And again, just uh, following up on Cassandra's question, because it is important to see what's not, you know, ranking higher. And I think that that's heavily dependent on who the respondents are. So do we have... Um, any information on who the respondents are other than uh, what's listed here. This is good, and this, this looks like it's a good cross-sector um, of folks, but I'm thinking geographically, were there um, uh, partnership districts that were included? Do we know rural versus, you know, Thank those? you for the question. We did ask for zip code, so we're going to analyze that information yet. What we do know is that there's, there's a lot of zip codes. So what we had hoped, we didn't ask regionally, we just asked for you to indicate what, what zip code you lived in. So we're still looking to see how do we compile that into a region that could be helpful for us. So if, if, I, if, if, if you're a teacher and you're 51% of the respondents, is, I would much rather know what type of school district they, they okay. served in. Okay. If that's how they were, if they were, well, I mean, I guess it depends on how, what, at this they were point, all 12,000 were put in all together, right? So we didn't parse any of them out individually at this point. So when you're seeing, you know, the percent of who said, here's the top eight, it's everyone combined. Okay. So I think in answer to your question, um, Dr. Pugh, we did not ask to identify where you work. We asked to identify the zip code where they lived. So the questions were, how do you identify yourself and then your zip code? I'm not sure that we will be able to get you the information that you're looking for based on the demographic information that we collected. Right. So, like, if you're asking a question and you're, if I'm an educator or a teacher, I might be answering as a parent, I might be answering as a, as a teacher. And they had the option to check all that apply, so they could answer as both an educator and as a parent. Okay. And then... I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Those are really interesting. Um, we're trying to tease out, are there opportunities to look at those? Um, here's what a teacher and he teacher who was a parent and, you know, what, how did they respond? But that's just as we're trying to look across crop to, across having, um, we'll, we're not sure how that will fall out yet. And I would really like to look at this information again based on who responded based on some of those, the other demographic information that, that you have. Okay. That we'll analysis sure to... is going to be the subject of the next month. Okay. <laughs> there, there's no question about it. We okay. we wanted to share with you the preliminary this is good. results. 
um, as quickly as we could. Okay. So survey ended on the 7th. We, we capped the right. survey at the 7th so that we could present to you on the 11th. Well, we know we've got a month's worth of work in front of us to provide you, you more information. If there are other th discrete uh, things that you want us to mine the data for, we're interested in hearing that too today. Um, Ms. Fecto, Mr. McMillan. Um, <clears throat> uh, so sort of um, building on what Pam said, um, so looking at the numbers, um, I think it's really great to see this. I think it's the turnout is wonderful, and I think all the work that's gone into this, it's really important to our goal to have more focus on um, where we're going and um, measuring that. My only concern is that so there may be minorities that um, that might not be reflected as the most popular um, goal, but that are really important um, because of you know, law or because of the, the, the need is so great. So like looking at um, African-American male gaps and learning, that might not be reflected because it's a minority of, or English language learners um, because they are a minority in the population and never mind among the demographics that we have. And then of course, you know, kids with disabilities. So I noticed that the kids with disabilities is in the lower half. And um, so I'm just saying that uh, it's good to have a gauge and then have more discussion, but also to keep in mind that there are some, you know, sometimes with the, ma just because the majority, I mean, it's important to know what the majority want, but also to filter through what is really um, some issues that, you know, we are, um, that we really should take to mind, even though they might not touch every single family or person that fills out these surveys. That's Thank you. Are you okay to respond to that, Dr. Rice? Yeah. Thank you for that. And I've only got to look at comments and the others, you know, just slightly since the close. But I think a lot of what you're talking about, we will see within those type of comments. I'm noticing a lot of people talking more personally within that and, and some references to some of the pieces you talked about, with, especially within other goals. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. McMillan. Well, I was basically going to say the same thing uh, as, <laughs> as Michelle said, except maybe from a little different angle. I guess, um, I mean, minorities could also be uh, rich kids from rich populations. That may only be 10 percent or uh, rural uh, that have different issues, you know, I mean, or real rural areas. So it could be any number of, uh, you know, non-majority uh, people. So like I noticed that nothing has 100 percent. Um, and so basically, I would, I would say the same thing. And I guess it, it kind of to step back, that question really begs the other question is, and maybe this is to Dr. Rice or to us, what are we going to do with these at the end? I mean, are they going to inform the majority of our efforts? Are they going to inform the majority of our lobbying? Are they going to... Uh, you know, I mean, I, I guess, you know, if, if everything is important, nothing's important. But then if something's important, then something's not important. Uh, and then, you know, in some areas, something could be very important that doesn't make the list. And so does that mean they just don't get help, but they can still do what they're doing? Or, you know, I guess, uh, so I, I, we don't have to flesh that out today. But I mean, I guess really the question of what are we going to do with these? It's a good it's question. A, it, it's, a, it's a good question. I'm going to let it uh, stay a rhetorical question okay. for a minute, but I'll come back to that when we get, get more deeply involved in the conversation. But I want the board to have the opportunity to, to share initial reflections first, and then, then I'll take a stab at the, um, the otherwise rhetorical question. Dr. Pritchett. Thank you. Uh, I am wondering, in step four here, the focus groups from March to April, I know you met with stakeholder groups, so who do you envision to be part of focus groups? So we're just starting the planning process for that right now, and we will bring that back to you. Hopefully we have either something we can share with you ahead of the March meeting. Um, so I don't want to give you an answer. We haven't fleshed it out Fine. completely yet. Okay. Thank you right, so much. Thank you. Other, uh, other reflections? Ms. Tilly, reflections? No? Not at this time? Uh, Ms. Ramos-Montini, reflections at this well, time? Well, I sit here in, uh, and I marvel the document. When we started, it was just a thought. And then look what it has evolved to. So, and of course, 
Brian Hoister is in my mind, right? Anytime we talk about this. Right. But th this is excellent. This is, I, I think, you know, your vision and what Brian's vision is gelling together so we know more concrete where we are and uh, where we're going. So, thank you this very is much. Good. I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, Mr. McMillan and then Ms. Lockheed. I, can I just. Um I guess I, to Cassandra's point to some degree, maybe that was, this wasn't her point, but there are 16 categories. There aren't, and you left it open for five, but, you know, I mean, based on the earlier uh, presentation we had, I mean, maybe one of them should be increased seat time waivers or flexibility or, you know, I mean, if that was a category, maybe it would have vaulted to the top or I, I don't know, but... Um, so you came up with these 16 based on the earlier discussions? On all of the interviews that we had, we took all of the information from the interviews, like the interviews with yourselves and then with the MDE staff and all, all those 22 stakeholders and business partners. We asked those questions related to what, what goals may you think? What issues are there? Do you remember those conversations that emerged? And then from that, we looked at patterns, you know, the hundreds and hundreds of data points and looked at patterns to see what we felt they all kind of group together with and put those in here. And we'll, that's why we added an other option because we were concerned we didn't want to put people into too many boxes, but we looked for where there was a break. So where there was lots and lots of comments around a certain item and then it kind of, was there more than 16? Yes, but they kind of fizzled out and then it just didn't seem to stay at the level of the other potential 16, if that makes sense. So in the, in the few dozen initial interviews, these were the 16 that arose as the, the most frequently mentioned. We decided to test them within a survey, but also casting a wider net to give people the opportunity to put in their write-in ballots, yeah. Yeah, if you but, will. I, but I think that uh, they may remain in the box with those five additional possibilities because, I mean, like I said, after this first, this uh, earlier presentation, you know, to me, maybe things have expanded a little bit for my view. I mean, um, I don't, when I talked with you, I don't know that I thought about the value of seat time waivers and uh, flexibility. I think maybe I mentioned something about it, but, you know, I mean, after hearing this morning, I, I don't know, I, you know, um, <coughs> if we brought Lou Glazer in here and said, think outside the box, he might bring up some ideas and add them on here and we'd say, wow, is that even possible? Okay, let's throw that on there and it might get a lot of, I don't know. Okay, President Albrecht. I agree. I think the what we need to kind of keep in mind is the difference between goals and tactics. Yeah, so goals, I think, are the overarching what do we want. And everything you're talking about, I think, falls under whatever the we oh, say the quality. most important goals are, um, which means we're not precluding those things yeah. from, be, from being of importance. But I, I completely understand what your point. Your point. Yeah, because it could fit into several mm -hmm. of these top right. five goals. Um, providing quality instruction for all students, mm -hmm. meeting the needs of the whole child. Um, I just have Thank one you. clarification. Yes. <laughs> so again, the data could totally look totally different for me, depending on the demographics. You bet. I mean, we have the zip codes. I don't know if we have any income data, but if there's, you know, when we look at this again, did we say that we can look at it? Maybe yeah, we'll cross being... tab. We'll cross tab okay. it to the best of our ability. Okay. So some of what you're interested in, we're going to be able to provide. Some of it, we're not going to be able to provide. We're not going to be specific. Be able to be specific in terms of where teachers serve, right. for example. Yeah, that's, that's um, okay. But we are going to be able to be specific about where people live. Um, sometimes it's a proxy for the same thing. Sometimes not, as you're as you're aware. So we're going to be able to provide a little bit greater clarity about how data cross tabs um, w with other data. And I think that that will be um, instructive. In the end, to the question that you've all raised, um, in some cases implicitly, in other cases explicitly, to what end the survey? And the answer is, is that the survey, like the interviews, like, like your uh, experiences and your, your knowledge, um, will help inform your judgment about what ends up becoming a part of the strategic education plan. What's clear is, is that too much plan is no plan. That, that to, to have something uh, laden 
um, you know, overly, overly burdened is to have no plan whatsoever because you can't focus on um, 15 different uh, goals, 12 different goals. You really have to, to choose. It's not to say that the things that don't rise to the status of goal are unimportant. It's simply to say that they don't rise to a primacy in what you're talking about. To, to our president's point on strategies versus goals, a lot of things are means to an end. And you have to decide if in any cases, in any case, those means deserve to be separately listed as goals. So I'll give you an example of this. In general, I think a strategic education plan should be about what kids leave schools with, what they can take with them, the knowledge, the skills, the abilities, um, and, 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 on the one hand. On the other hand, there are inputs that are so extraordinary that they drive the outputs or that they help drive the outputs. And you may want to consider one or more of those inputs as a freestanding goal in addition to your output goals. And then one other point on numbers. It is true that this is not per se a popularity contest. You're elected officials and you have to sift through what's ultimately important for a strategic education plan. So I would say respectfully that while the numbers are interesting and compelling in a variety of ways, that a low number doesn't necessarily mean that that particular concept doesn't become a goal or become mentioned in some way, shape, or form. And then to the notion of mention versus the notion of a goal. So there are some things that rise to the level of a goal. There are other things that overarch all of our goals in terms of a, uh, a preamble or I'm so sorry. in terms of a, uh, a <laughs> preamble or what you have currently, a set of guiding principles. And I think those guiding principles are very powerful, um, as are the mission and vision, and that they need to be reincorporated into a top 10 uh, 2.0, however rethought. Ms. Lockheed. I don't know if I want to follow you, Dr. Rice. Um, I just, I want to uh, say that the Regional Teachers of the Year and I were one of the um, groups that, was, that were interviewed, and I see a lot of what we talked about in here. Um, but I'm heartened and relieved to see that funding rose to the top. Um, because I think if, if districts were given the equitable funding and then some flexibility to use it how they need, then some of these other things districts would hopefully use the funding to get what they need for the students that they're serving, which might not be the same in every district. Um, I know we don't, or you don't do funding necessarily, <laughs> so I'm hoping this gets to the right people. Um, but the fact that all of these people all over the state took this survey and they recognize that equitable funding is what is needed is really, it, it makes me feel good. Thank you very much. Positive. President Albridge. I'm really, I'm glad that you mentioned that because one of the conversations that I had with Brian on more than one occasion was that we had a top 10 and 10 agenda that was in many ways beholden on things outside of our control. Uh, and, and I really hope what we come up with this time that we are realistic and we have an expectation that if this board agrees that these are the these are strategies and goals that we want, that it's our responsibility to work with the legislature to make that happen, uh, because we can come up with all the goals in the world, and if legislation exists that prevents us from success in those goals, then it really, you know, it's it's the top ten and ten was a great document. But at the end of the day, there were too many things in there that were dependent and beholden on things that we couldn't control. Mm -hmm. And we need to step up and take more of a, a ownership over uh, working to overcome those things. Thank you very much. Other reflections on the part of board members? Other reflections? Um, as far as the survey results, I guess I didn't ask this, but as far as who took it, 
you know, obviously this adds up to way more than 100%. So we're, how many parent or guardians are not in the system? Meaning are not teachers or not, I mean, it, it, could somebody check off teacher and parent? Yes. Yes. Okay. You can check so how many, do we know how many parent or guardians are just simply parents of children in the education system <laughs> or not, just t taxpayers? We, yes, we can definitely get the information for you. Okay. And then, okay, I think you answered my rhetorical at one time rhetorical question you said, you said how we're going to develop them but um did you answer what we're going to do with them what's the them the the goals the the result of this whole exercise what so, are we going to what's it going to do for you and the department what what is it, it resources is it well it's a, it's a few things one it focuses the activity of the department um not not fully but on the margins. There are certain things that we, we have to do irrespective of what you do at this table. Whether you have a strategic education plan, what you have in the, is a strategic education plan, there are certain things we have to do as a, as a state education department. We'll continue to do those. But on the margins, this will help focus our activity. That's one. Two, it will focus our activity relative to other um, other entities, the state legislature, for example, our state associations, for example, our 842 LEAs, for example, what they do for 1.5 million public school children in more than 3,000 schools across the state, for example. It is a local control state, but what we encourage can in part be a function of what you designate as strategic education goals. And again, these are not goals for the department. They are goals for public education in the state of Michigan. They are what we are trying to make of public education in the state of Michigan broadly read, recognizing that it is harder to do what we do in Michigan than in a state, uh, for example, like uh, Maryland, which has 24 districts. We have 842 districts, about two-thirds the population, 24 districts versus 842 districts. We're not a centrally controlled education state. We're not going to become one. We're a local control education state. So how do you influence the education of 1.5 million public school children in the state of Michigan, 842 LEAs? Uh, this is a part of that. This exercise is a part of narrowing the focus to some degree. It's not to say that what isn't mentioned is unimportant or is undone. It doesn't deserve the same level of, of primacy. Okay. Um, other um, questions, comments, concerns, fears, phobias, neuroses. No. Let's do a little. Let's do a little pulsing um, with respect to um, the goal of literacy. Literacy was raised. Um, you will notice um, that um, literacy is one of the top four and um, one of the top two in terms of output goals. Does any board member um, believe that that ought not to be a goal area for our strategic education plan? Can I just? Please. I, I would say that it certainly should be. I would say that getting back to the tactics or strategies, it could be detrimental. <laughs> we saw that with kindergarten teachers having to do 200 checkoffs in order to make sure that in three years from now they're going to or going to be able to read so it's taking so I mean it as much as I agree with it you know when we get down to the tactics it could well I mean it could go the other way for me as far as it, it could but but a state education department ought to not be responsible for the teaching of reading um, or the specific tactics around reading we can be responsible for the promotion of the literacy essentials, for example, the development and promotion and the professional development around the literacy essentials. But we ought not to be so granular that, that we're involved. Agree. Yeah, OK. All right. And, and we ought not to in, um, be encouraging read aside, I think, is what you're talking about. Right. OK. The, uh, the deadening approach to the, the teaching of reading. So um, Dr. Pugh. So, I'm the person who, not the person, but a person who is much more concerned with the upstream factors that would drive mm -hmm. literacy. So um, while I believe that literacy is critical, 
Mm-hmm. Um, I just, it, it, to me, I don't think if you're meeting, if you're not meeting the needs of the whole child, if you're not addressing um, the funding, if you're not addressing the teacher shortage, um, the equity in education, then you know, I, I think that those things are more critical and more important, more urgent to then get to the critical issue of literacy. Okay. So, so hopefully I, that answered a question yep, for you. It it it, uh, it it answered it answered one and uh, begged two or prompted two. So what I heard you say was that you believe that adequate and equitable funding deserves to be a separate goal, it being more upstream, if you will, to your analogy, um, and that you believe that addressing the teacher shortage um, has to be a separate and distinct goal as well. Hold on. And the whole child. Okay. I want to come back to whole child in one moment, if I could, okay, because whole child is a is a separate, very important and very complex area. Um, so I want to come back to it, but I want to do it due justice over a period of months. Um, to Dr. Pugh's point about the two upstream goals, if you will. Uh, one, the addressing of the teacher shortage, um, the other, the um, the provision of adequate and equitable school funding. Uh, board members, your thoughts thereon. Ms. Well, you Ms. Ramos, know, uh, the teacher shortage uh, crisis is being top of my brain uh, because we can have we we can have all these different laws about literacy and and testing and all of these things. But if you don't have the instructors in front of the students, that's not going to happen. Now, another thing that I am, and I put a little star right here, meeting the needs of the whole child, and I know you're going to get back to that. But yesterday I was uh, part of a, of a round table, and, and we touched, in my remarks, I touched bullying. For whatever reason, you know, the question led me to that. And so at the end of the, the session, I had uh, four people come and talk to me about bullying. And I told them a little bit about what, I told the whole group the little that we're doing mm -hmm. to make it a strong emphasis in the school districts to work more diligently in this crisis. So um, my point is, if the student does not feel good about himself or herself, and we have all these other wonderful things that we want to accomplish with that student, but he's being bullied every day, and, and it could be for many reasons. His clothes, his hair, uh, his ethnic background, many reasons. I just feel so passionately for these students. Uh, because we want them to do all these other things, uh, but the, the students are not, they're not feeling good about themselves. They're, they're coming to a, an environment that's so hostile <coughs> and so demeaning and so disrespectful and so many other things. And I know that would probably uh, fall under, so I want to hear what you have to say about Okay. Meeting the needs of the whole child. So I heard, I heard that as an endorsement for Dr. Pugh's um, whole child goal, however constituted. Um, I didn't hear a disagreement associated with addressing teacher shortage or school funding. Is that right? I, I think, I think uh, meeting the needs of the whole child is number way up there, even before one, if okay. that's possible. All right, fair enough. It's the, it's the, it's the pre-one. Yes, it's it's really critical, really okay. critical. All right, and then the shortage, and then the funding. In my, that's all the the three. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pritchett. Thank you. Um, as I look at the first set of results, not this slide, but the earlier slide, and I look at providing quality instruction for all students and improving literacy reading achievement, I see those almost as together. I mean, if we have quality instruction, then that would obviously feed into improved literacy for all students. Um, the, the other two, though, the providing adequate funding and the teacher shortage, um, I think are 
those issues that we have to recognize. If we don't have that, I don't know how we're going to be able to provide that quality instruction. Um, but I, the teacher shortage, I want to be very, very careful about the fact that we're just not filling classrooms with individuals who aren't adequately prepared. Thank you. Um, the quality instruction, we know research is very, very clear that it's the teacher in front of the students every day that makes the difference, period. Um, no question resources, no question support, no question the support that we can give the child as they come in with their myriad of, of issues that they walk through the door with. But it is the quality of the instruction that's happening every day and the support we can provide to that classroom teacher. But I want to be very, very clear that teacher shortage doesn't mean just saying, okay, we're going to put this individual in here so we have an adult in the room. Um, because it's way bigger than what that is. So those are, uh, but I certainly concur with Dr. Pugh on those two issues. Okay, thank you very much. Other, uh, other individuals on um, the, the two upstream issues that Dr. Pugh raised, uh, addressing the teacher shortage and um, school funding. Um, I see a, I see Ms. Lahey. Um, um. And Mr. McMillan. I've been learning a lot about how all of this works. It's been a very illuminating year. Um, and one of the things I'm noticing is that everybody, everywhere I go, is talking about teacher shortage or paraprofessional shortage as well and substitute shortage because that's all part of the same problem. Um, but everybody, from a, whether it's a small district to a bigger district, to here at the state to um, separate entities, they're all trying to fix it themselves. Um, and there's a lot of siloing, like a lot of, well, here's what we're doing. Well, these people are doing that too. <laughs> and so are these people. And I, I would just wonder if, um, if MDE could be a leader in some way of bringing more of these groups. And I've seen some of that, bringing groups together to get input on various initiatives. Um, because, I mean, for instance, the governor proposed some money for teacher cadet, which is one of the things that my district is trying to do. And it's one of the things that we do, we do here at MDE is, is provide um, teacher training for high school students. Um, but there just seems to be a lot of, like, uh, separate groups doing work on that. And if there could be more of a unified front, I think we might move faster or maybe, maybe more efficiently? There's no question. It's a good point. I'm going to share um, a smidgen on this issue in my um, superintendent's report this afternoon. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, Mr. McMillan, Ms. Fecto. Um, I guess on funding, it just it, a lot of it rely, uh, falls to the definition. Um, if we're talking about taking money from families in Rochester School District that send $12,000 to the, to the state and then get 8000 back, that's, that's one way to uh, make more equitable funding, uh, I suppose, if that's what you're talking about. Uh, it could be that uh, we, look, we focus on how much money is going to admin, so maybe it's equitable funding to the classroom, because maybe uh, overhead has increased incredibly over the last 20 years. I don't know, and so uh, there's plenty of money, it's just that it's not being spent well. Um, so I don't know exactly the def definition of providing adequate and equitable funding. Some of it might be because we spend so much time uh, fulfilling mandates that are meaningless out of Lansing. I don't know. Uh, addressing teacher shortage, uh, you know, are we, are we making it too, are we raising the bar too high? And I mean, there's some areas that who do have teacher shortages. There are others that don't. Uh, you know, there's other areas that it's just certain subjects. Um, you know, maybe we, the teacher shortages in one area could be uh, dealt with by getting rid of the teacher evaluations and uh, and high stakes testing and really allowing teachers the ability to do the best for the kids in front of them instead of worrying about other things that aren't as important. So. You know, I, I know that those, I'm talking a little bit about tactics there, but it's also in the definition of what, addressing what teacher shortage. There's plenty of, uh, of groups that say there's not that much teacher shortage. Um, in certain areas there might be, um, but, you know, are we, 
are we putting too many standards on? So if we reduced uh, certain standards that, you know, and just made them very effective, the real important ones, maybe we'd lower the bar or we would lower the uh, bar to entry, not lower the bar, but lower the uh, barrier to entry. Barrier to yeah. entry. Um, <laughs> and so I, I, it, a lot of it to me it goes to the definition of what these exactly mean. Providing equity, fairness, and education, I mean, a lot of people define that as seat time waivers. Uh, that was why, you know, we got to make everybody equal so that we force them to sit in the seat though. Or, but we just heard that uh, that might not be the best thing that might be harmful. That if So a lot of it's in definitions, I guess. Okay, fair enough, thank you. Ms. Vecto? <clears throat> That's interesting and, you know, I think looking at targeted programs and um, where the shortages are and, um, figuring out solutions, but I don't know any solution that doesn't involve money. That's the only problem. Um, and there's been a decline in teacher prep. I believe it's 55% in Michigan. We've got one of the biggest declines in people even going into the teaching profession. And I think it's for all the reasons you said, too. I think it's not just, you know, it's the, it's the profession itself has been under such attack and um, and even though it's like they say teachers are the number one reason, but then we're going to hold them accountable and, you know, beat them until, or I don't know. It, it, so I think it's not, so I think a part of it is the, the, the money to pay them well, give them decent benefits, give them a decent pension, God forbid, um, and to attract them to come. But I also think it's just the environment. My husband's a teacher. He's my daughter's just started her first job. Um, in Plymouth Canton <laughs> um, and uh, he's was telling her don't do it don't do it don't do it the whole time don't be a teacher and he loved he loved being a teacher so I think part of it is that the it, it, it's money but it's also that and I, I just was seeing about a bill that's being talked about today in the Senate where they want to provide alternative means to become a special ed teacher so that makes me wonder so there's a shortage so let's just do it on the cheap you know, and, and so the solution is, yeah, we can get people, I know there's permanent subs, they're now doing it, but why not look at a way to maybe give forgiveness uh, or make it more affordable for people to become special ed teachers or wherever the critical need is, science, math, to forgive their student debt if they go into a, a profession where there's, it's really helping our society and there's a high need instead of just lowering the bar, not doing anything about the teacher valuations and expecting things to <coughs> get better. It just seems sort of, so, so I guess I think the discussion around um, how we're going to get there, the goals are good, but I think that the devil's in the details and I think we have to um, not just look about putting anybody in front of kids not just look at paying them more, but also look at the environment in which they're working in and um, and listening to them. And I love the fact that you brought up para pros and subs. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody, because that is yeah. really, and those folks are really, uh, they work really hard and they do not get compensated the way mm -hmm. they should be. So um, I'm done. <laughs> so, so I, I, I heard that We're as uh, I just want to I want to okay. make sure that I, I, I heard correctly. I heard that as a yes to addressing the teacher shortage, mm -hmm. yes. um, with some specifics as to how we might go about doing that. Um, I heard that as a uh, a yes for adequate and equitable oh, school funding. Emphatic yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Emphatic Fair enough. Yes. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, Ms. Tilly, any any thoughts you care you to see share? see it in my face or something? I, I do. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I, I, I just, the whole equitable funding thing, um, when you're in a bubble and you're in Rochester Hills or wherever you are, yes, things are adequate. But when you are in urban areas, rural areas, poor areas, it's not adequate, so it's, it, it needs to be equitable. I had babies in classrooms that were upset because they couldn't take books home. And they couldn't take books home because there weren't enough books. And some of the books were very old. So yes, funding needs to be equitable. Um, there's not enough money in some districts. And I just wanna be clear about that. Okay, fair enough. And then with respect to addressing the teacher shortage? Um, that's, it's an issue in Michigan, and it's a national issue. Mm -hmm. 
as I go around to conferences, that's that's a part of the conversation. So, so to the to the numbers that were earlier cited, um, there is a um, a report which we can make available to the board. It came out uh, two months ago. It's a December two thousand nineteen report from Center for American Progress. It lists the percentage change in participants in teacher ed prep programs from 2010 to 2018. Percentage, percentage change in teacher ed prep program um, participation uh, decline nationally is 35 percent. The decline in Michigan, 67 percent. In terms of completers of teacher ed prep programs, same time period, 2010 to 2018, decline um, nationally, 27%. Decline in completers in Michigan, 54%. Michigan, um, one of the highest two in each of the two categories. That does not say that we have a shortage. It is consistent with us having a shortage. What says we have a shortage <coughs> is several hundred superintendents who, when asked, all say, we've got issues. Several hundred principals who, when asked, all say, we have an issue, who are borrowing or sharing with or stealing from one another mm -hmm. on a uh, pretty pronounced basis. To Mr. McMillan's point, it is more pronounced in certain subject areas, there's no doubt. And in certain geographic areas, that is true as well. But those of us who haven't struggled, Dr. Quinn, to hire teachers back in the day, or in any day, are now struggling. We are now experiencing a new normal. It is a new day in Michigan. And to suggest otherwise is to deny our current reality. Now, how we address it? That's a different conversation. But that it's a thing, that it's an issue, I think is incontrovertible. And, and those of us who are in it on a daily basis um, feel it on a, on a regular basis. Ms. Tilly. I just wanted to add, too, when you talk to the kids, um, they're very conscious that they don't have um, adequate teachers in their, in their classrooms. They're feeling it. They will say so. They do. They do. And, and, and I might add, they say it to you, and they say it to other people, too. Because mm -hmm. I've heard it also. Um, and not simply in my former district, but in the districts that I visited this year. OK? When you get in a small group with kids or one-on-one -on -one with kids, they'll say, hey, what's up with? Why am I being taught math by a computer or science? by a computer. What's up with that? Or I haven't had a teacher in a certain subject area all year. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Right. And they, they don't necessarily know how to, um, they don't know how to dress up the question, <laughs> but they are very clear and very real, mm -hmm. very fast yeah. about what the issue is. Um, Dr. Pugh and then Ms. Snyder. I'll let, because I don't think you've gone yet, yeah. so go ahead. No, I, I'm, I'm good for now. Oh, okay. all okay. right. So, and, and mine is just to add to the conversation. You know, I think the terms that we use, that Dr. Pritchett, you brought up, brought this up, and Michelle and and um, Ms. Lahid brought this up. But the term that we used in the goals, you know, obviously we're talking. We would like to go more upstream when we talk about teacher uh, shortage because we do know that you know there are many drivers. Of, of teacher shortage so that's one thing but you know this is where we are and then obviously teachers uh, we would like to expand that because it's not uh, just just teachers that we're talking about but you know I think one of the things that really concerns me is with this issue it was not that long ago that you know we weren't really necessarily seeing it everybody wasn't seeing this as an urgent <clears throat> issue and sometimes when this happens in certain communities and certain populations, it's not a big deal for everyone. But this is one of those issues, just by those stark statistics that you just gave us. I mean, it's like a forest fire 
you know, before you know it, you have Australia, <laughs> you know, because we're not focused on the little fire in, in, in your neighbor's backyard. You know, I think one of the things that we brought up uh, as it relates to, you know, the funding, again, we always focus on the local districts. We're looking at how maybe uh, we're, we're fighting over pennies uh, within local districts, but this is a larger issue. And it's not just too many administrators. There's not enough administrators in, in many of these buildings, most of these buildings. There's other things at play when we talk about the funding. I mean, we talked and we heard here how uh, we're backfilling uh, funding that's going out to developers and, and uh, corporations and billionaires. So there's a bigger conversation that needs to be had. Uh, and, and I commit to raise, continuing to raise my voice around these issues. But, um, you know, in this profession, as critical as it is, we have to look at what's affecting the least of, of these uh, because it's coming in the direction of everyone if we don't address it. Thank you very much. Any other um, thoughts from any other board member? If not, let me just say a, a word on whole child. Um, in, in discussions that we've had, there is, it appears, a commitment to try to craft a whole child goal. Um, is, that, is, that, um, is that true? Is that not true? I'm seeing um, um, uh, a face from Ms. Snyder. Your thoughts? Not necessarily? It just depends on what whole child means. Fair enough. So, so th that, is, that is a challenge, as I mentioned earlier. It really, it really turns on how we define. And I think what, what our board has shared over a period of time is, is they don't want children to be viewed only from the vantage point of the academic or the cognitive or the intellectual, but in terms of all of their needs, their physical needs, their, their mental health needs, their socio-emotional needs, and the like. And so it, it would be in that spirit that we might reflect upon that sort of goal. So I throw that out to, to the board for, for your thoughts. Any, any thoughts that you care to share in that regard? This was, this was, as I understood it, this was the board's effort to make clear that schools were more than just about how you do on narrow assessments. Okay, so, um, okay, Mr. McMillan? I'm I'll sorry. just say that, you know, when I, you were talking about whole child. I am, yes. So, I mean, again, and what um, Snyder said, it depends on definition, because in my circles, uh, we, we see so, there's oftentimes uh, an assault on parental rights when you start talking about the whole child and becoming the parent of these kids, because uh, the extreme example, which happens, is that a, you know you end up getting health clinics or nurses that will help a child get an abortion without the parents knowing anything about it uh, because we've got to worry about the whole child and the government is now the one dealing with that so you know I mean that's that's the extreme example that does happen so you know I mean I know that there's other examples where it's really good I mean it broke my heart when we were in visiting schools when uh, Snyder was trying to or his administration was trying to tr shut down schools and you know the, they said we needed to get a washer and dryer in this because the kids were coming to school with clothes that hadn't been washed in four days I mean yes I you know those situations but I don't want to provide funding for washers and dryers for the whole state um, I'd like it to be I don't know I'd, I'd like also to see churches and nonprofits step up to the plate and start helping out in, in ways as well so uh, the more government does the less that uh, people feel that they have to do it voluntarily or through churches. So, I mean, it's just, it, it really depends on definitions. Fair enough. No, I understand. So, so you're, you're, you are not opposed to the notion of a goal, um, uh, however constituted, a, a goal in this area um, subject to the details. Fair enough. Okay. And it's very much a local control conversation. Absolutely. When but, you're talking about uh, education institutions talking about abortions with kids, it's a big deal. Right, that's but a, that's a parental role. That is that is not an education role. It, it it's not an education role and it's not permitted by law. Yeah. So but so let's be let's just be clear about that. Boundary. I mean we what, are. what's that? We're flirting with that boundary. Um, no, not not in this room we're not. 
okay, and not, and not in our work on the strategic education. But I just want to be clear, that's not what we're talking about. When we're, when we're reflecting upon um, this, this goal. It's not what I have in mind. Um, it's not, I don't believe, what Dr. Pugh was referring to when she raised the, the issue. And I, I defer to, to her in, in that regard. Um, President Albridge. So I just want to point to these mugs that we have in the back <laughs> that say poverty matters. Mm -hmm. To me, that's, that's kind of what we're talking about. We're talking about uh, kids coming to school who are hungry, who, uh, you know, Michelle has, uh, you know, taken in so many kids that have had vision problems and hearing problems. And when those things get addressed, they can learn. But it takes somebody, uh, you know, and, and it's great if it's the parent, but it's, it, that's not always a possibility. So what I think we're talking about is being able to recognize the special needs that each individual child might have and how can we make sure that they get those needs met so that they can actually learn in the classroom. Um, I, I don't think this has anything to do with, with uh, I wouldn't even say it, but uh, we're not talking about the issues that have just been raised here at the table. We're talking about granular issues that kids need so that they can be successful in the classroom. And we know from every piece of data that we have seen that socioeconomic issues impact uh, the measurable outcomes that we throw on the table. Uh, and you can argue whether or not those measurable outcomes are what we should be measuring or, or looking at. But the reality is, uh, you know, years ago when we put up the scatter graph that showed uh, the schools that were performing well and the schools that weren't, and then color-coded it based on poverty, no surprise that the schools in the bottom quartile were all red because they were low-income schools, and the schools in the top quartile were all yellow because they were higher-income uh, regions. And so I think that it's, it's important. I don't know how you measure it, and I don't know how you even really define it, um, but I think it's, it's important to at least recognize that this is an issue, and if we want to improve the outcomes of students in Michigan, we have to at least grasp um, that the, these Understood. issues exist, and what can we do to help that? So, um, Ms. Ramos-Montini. Right. Um, There's exactly what I believe we're trying to to say here. Um, and I think the Innovation Academy was a good picture of what we're talking about. If the, they, they talked about if a student comes with pro, you know, problems that happen at home, they couldn't see, whatever, and they want to play basketball for 45 minutes, so be it. As long as we get to then ponder on the lesson of the day and they meet those requirements. Whatever it takes to meet the needs of the child so they can learn. And that's, I think, that's the definition that I see that we're talking about uh, the whole child, educating the whole child. And again, I say bullying is a very much part of this scenario because we, we have to have safe and orderly environments for our students to learn. And we have to be more intentional about doing that. And I think, again, the Innovation Academy was a good picture of all of these things that we're talking about. They're implementing it. Thank you very much. So, so um, do, do I, are those, are those uh, raised pencils? Or, <laughs> yes. or, the, the, or are they um, <laughs> budding projectiles? Um, no, no, no. Do, Dr. <laughs> Pugh, Ms. Fecko. Right at time. No, it's just <laughs> no, Tom, your concerns that you have, I, I would share those concerns that you expressed. I think in, in the answer to the question, uh, Dr. Rice is no. The, those were not my intentions when I brought this up. And um, to, to Lupe, I, I was going to mention the same thing, is that we had a good example of how we're looking at uh, the whole child in that, that model. Um, I think I gave this, exam this, this thought or this experience that I had um, a couple of months ago when I was speaking with a, a, an educator who shared with me that in one day during testing time, she spoke with three students that had been raped. 
that was sitting in, in her office and pricing, but that needed to then go and take a test. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as that educator, as that student, the pressure is there. Do you shove them into that classroom in front of that test, or do you have the necessary tools? Uh, do you have the blessing of this department to take care of that individual, that person, that human being? Or are you concerned about that test score? So I mean, I think that that's a, a, an example that I would be more focused on. Um, as far as dealing with uh, children who deal with poverty, we're talking about uh, the high incidence of experience with traumatic experiences, the educators who have to deal with the trauma that they have to experience, me, and just hearing that story and what it does to me. But, you know, I'm, anyway, I could go on and on, but that's what I think we're, we're focusing on. And that's probably um, happening. Uh, at a greater incident rate than, than, what, than what we're thinking, those type of experiences, let alone the health and well-being of children who are showing up who may not have, uh, and may not be in the same uh, physical health as, as, as um, other students uh, based on food access. We could go on and on and on, environment, and I'll just stop there. When, and it, just yeah, just one point, and, and not not only they had the the people that came today, they have small class sizes. I could tell very very mm -hmm. small. Yeah. So you you can imagine a teacher that has 25, 35, 45, mm -hmm. 50 mm -hmm. students, and and then you have to deal with all of these different problems, whatever, and try to teach them. Mm -hmm. That's when you know we have to break it down and see what we can do. To, to teach something for the day. But you have to take care of all these other things before that happens. And it may be, it, it may be that we look at a health, safety, and welfare goal rather than something that is labeled whole child, which may, yeah. which may yeah. have, yeah. Which may yeah. have um, kind of a, an, uh, may, may, may repel right. some um, kind of from a nomenclature perspective. Mm -hmm. Health, safety, and welfare, I think, is um, perhaps a little less, um, it doesn't necessarily generate the same reaction from some. And again, I do think it turns on what are we measuring? What are we trying to, to because uh, it's hard to argue with children eating, um, children having the requisite food, um, children having the, 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 the requisite um, care physically, um, you know, it's hard to learn if you have a toothache. It's hard to learn if you're sick in some other um, don't have glasses. Some other way, <laughs> you know, if you can't, if you can't see. So I think it's really in that spirit that this is that this is raised uh, by some. Um, so anyway, Ms. Fecto, you have the benediction. Okay. Did I get on my knees? Oh, I beg oh, your pardon. M Ms. I Tilly wants a benediction. Two oh, okay. benedictions. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say, I think, <clears throat> um, you know, from where I've um, come from, you know, I've seen example after example that if you invest, even if it's getting a washer machine and every mm -hmm. whatever, it, it's cheaper than the outcome of, a, of someone who doesn't have an education and is sort of hopeless or gets involved with crime or drugs because, you know, or has a very low wage job and is, lives. So they're not con contributing. If there's a way to help and invest to make sure that the kids are taken care of, and a lot of parents, even in poor communities, are great parents, you know. They're, but there are people who just don't um, have the resources or the time because they're working three jobs or whatever it is, or they're addicted to opioids or they're whatever the issues are. Um, that don't aren't there to advocate for their kids, and and I like the idea of bringing the community together and finding ways. But as a parent, the one thing that drives me crazy is that I don't want anybody proselyte, pros, pushing their religious views yeah. on my kids. <laughs> that will get me going. But um, so and so I agree that parents should have a certain amounts of rights in these things. Um, Proselytizing—that's the word I was trying to say. But anyway, I'm just saying I think. Um, uh, we should do all we can to the support the parents so that they can provide a good home. And that's a lot to ask of the education system because 
I mean, it's 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 um it's much broader than that. But I think we can certainly whatever we can invest. I think it pays out in the end if we can keep kids in school, hopeful, taken care of. And and I I bring up this. My, I've had a daughter who didn't have. She's in foster care, and I had to go. And the teacher said she flunked the test, and it was written on the board. And I said. I said, Taryn, can you read that? I'm sorry, I said her name. And uh, and uh, she was like, no, when she needed glasses. And she very, did very well on the test when she saw the, the glasses. And I had another young man who I adopted when he was 16. And he was profoundly, uh, he had some significant hearing loss. And the school just didn't have the resources to get him hearing aids. And his parents were both died of um, drug and alcohol related um, they were not able to take care of him. So as soon as I got him on my insurance, I got him those hearing aids. And he, his grades soared. And he didn't feel like he was stupid anymore. And so it's the same school, same teachers, same everything. But he just needed those supports. And their society, I mean, did, was, was not provide for whatever reason, they were... He, and, was not providing it to him. That's all he needed to be a successful student and to graduate high school, um, the first young man in his family to do so. So, um, yeah. So I think that, I think if we can invest that and give people better futures, it's going to make it better for all of us in the end. We pay, you know, so. Thank you. Ms. Tilly. So one of Tom's points, and it's in no way to replace equitable funding, but there should be more um, nonprofit and private partnerships created with schools. And Southfield right now is creating an excellent model. Um, our anti-drug coalition that I run, will, we're going to have an office there in kind across the hall in that same wing. Um, Ascension will have an office. They're going to create a health clinic for the teens. Um, there's other organizations that are there in that wing, a career and technical center. I think those partnerships um, will help to buffer some of the, of the things that the schools, you know, need help with and, and, and bring needed resources. Okay. So I think that's something that we should explore too. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Alice, Ms. Carter, we appreciate your presentation. Board, thank you for the discussion. The next item on the Committee of the Whole Agenda is presentation on what matters for literacy outside of the school day. This presentation will provide data and information on before and out of school time learning programs supporting literacy, 21st century community learning centers, access to literacy through e-library, and Meet Up, Eat Up, and Read Up programs. This presentation is informational and requires no board action. Our presenters this morning are Dr. Scott Kennigschnecht, Deputy Superintendent, P20 System and Student Transitions, Dr. Brandy Boogley, Literacy Manager, and Mr. Richard Lauer, Director of Preschool and Out of School Time Learning. There will be a PowerPoint presentation. Gentle people, good morning. Morning, Dr. Rice. Thank you. And thank you uh, to the State Board for allowing us some time to, uh, to present to you and share information with you this morning, really on the intersection of um, two activities that um, are near and dear to us here at the department, one being literacy um, and two being out of school time learning opportunities. And so this is a great example of another cross department initiative um, as Dr. Bugney and Mr. Lauer have worked very hard um, to pull this information together. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our presenters. Great. Um, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to talk about what matters outside of the school day, especially in support of literacy. So we're going to kick this off with a short video um, that really addresses summer slide much better, we thought, than we could do in words. So we'll share you um, this video, and I, Richard warned me that as soon as we hit the next slide, it will start. Is that correct? Correct. All right. So it's just a two-minute video, and so prepping for focus. Let's look at two children, one from a middle-income family, the other from one of the millions of low-income American families. As the two kids head off to kindergarten, look what happens. The middle-income child starts out with a six-month lead. 
The low-income child is already falling behind because of a lack of access to early reading and preschool education. During their year in kindergarten, in the same school and classroom, the two children will learn at about the same rate, so we'll move them both forward nine months. But look what happens in that first summer between kindergarten and first grade. Our middle-income child moves ahead about a month in reading because learning of one kind or another continues over the summer. The low-income child falls back about two months. So when school begins again, when they go back for first grade, the gap between them has already widened. During first grade, again, they move ahead at about the same rate, another nine months. That next summer, the activities and lifestyle of the middle-income family keep that child moving forward, but the low-income child has fewer opportunities to reinforce good habits like reading, and that child falls farther behind. Then we come to second grade, and again, our two children learn at the same rate. But the summer after second grade sets our low-income child back again, and our middle-income child moves forward again, and the gap widens again. By just the third grade, the two children are already far apart. By the end of fifth grade, the gap between the children is two and a half to three years. It will keep growing through middle school. So you see, without addressing what's happening during the summer, it is impossible to ever catch up. It's impossible to close the gap. No matter how much high quality learning goes on from September to June, mm -hmm. every year the gap widens. Our presentation will touch on that gap, but it will really touch on everything uh, where we can, all the time that we can leverage outside of school um, that can support literacy. We're gonna talk a little bit about some of the programs that the department offers some of the ways schools are already funding out of school time um, or summer programs or opportunities um, and some of the challenges. And we'll also talk about some of that summer slide and what matters um, before kids, kiddos even get to school um, to leverage literacy. So we're hoping that you'll leave today with a good understanding of where we might have some roles as educators and our partners might have some roles and schools might have some role to think about how we can really effectively leverage that time outside of school that supports literacy. And so while I'm the literacy manager and I could talk about literacy in the classroom all day, all the time, um, I was told I get two slides. So <laughs> we, um, we also, you also know that in the state we're working really strongly with our partners around what happens for students in classrooms and what kids should be experiencing. And you've heard um, Susan Townsend, who's in our audience today, talk about the essentials that um, MAISA's general education leadership networks Early Literacy Task Force um, put together, we have identified practices that are research supported to support students' literacy development and they're practices that we can trust, schools can rely on, that if kids receive these every in every classroom every day, it will impact their literacy learning. So with that said, the literacyessentials.org has um, not just for our K3 and our preschool, but for every age band from birth through grade 12, they've developed those um, essential practices. And I'll just say they're not something that we've done. We are doing them. We're still getting out awareness and diving into and providing support on those. Um, and so I, I would be remiss to not um, address that for the essentials, um, we're working on some marketing campaigns, awareness, um, to make sure that schools know that for the time that kids are in schools, these essentials are practices they can rely on. Um, they attend to, some of you are familiar with a lot of the recent legislation or articles, news reports on the science of reading. Those essentials address the science of reading components, which would really is about how teachers understand the process of learning to read and address those through what research has identified as important. So you've probably heard, I have to remind myself every time, phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, 
vocabulary and comprehension. Those are all addressed in these standards that are in these essentials that the standards are addressed. That's what we're hoping kids receive in the classroom. And there's professional learning available for schools to get free access to that knowledge in the essentials and support through literacy coaching um, from the ISD level and beyond because we have a great coaching network. And so when you um, break for lunch today, we do have um, a brand new hot off the press, like I said, it's in the works here. Um, this document on how schools if you're, that you're working with might want more information on how they can provide kids access to this and teachers learning about the essentials. We have that and we have the essentials. So it's kind of long-winded, um, I think, don't shoot me, but um, I just want to say we're doing a lot of great things in the classroom while kids are in school and there's lots more learning that can be done and is available. With that said, um, very simple calculations on hours. So what you see on the left is the hours in a year um, and then how much time kids spend in school during that time. So very just simple, yes, it's all the hours, not just waking hours right there. And on the right, in a child's lifetime from zero to 18, number of total hours and then how much time children are spending in school. So we've got lots of time to work on the essentials there. We've got lots of time to work on good practices, lots of work to be done. And also, we see that that leaves a lot of time where students are not in school that can be leveraged to support their learning and specifically their literacy learning. So we're really focused today on um, that time, those hours not in school. So we start with uh, before kindergarten, just to really set the foundation that emergent literacy or literacy in the zero to three area where receptive vocabulary from parents and caregivers is essential to infants and toddlers. Brandy spoke to the fact that we have essentials um, for infants and toddlers. That's part of the full package because it's important. Vocabulary experiences matter, even to children of our very youngest children who are not speaking themselves. They need to hear languages. They need to hear words from their caregivers. And that sets the foundation for later literacy and reading proficiency later in life. And how we support families in the context of literacy and emergent literacy um, in those early years matters. So that's just the main points on this uh, slide. When we think about out of school time, it is in the early years as well as within the traditional K-12 before, after, and summer time. And one of the key um, studies that came out in the mid-90s and then reaffirmed in the 2000s was the Hart and Risley study uh, in the early years, um, looking at the first three years of life in particular and how the issue of socioeconomic status, and you've been speaking about that quite a bit um, this morning I heard, thinking about the number of words and they found, they put a number, 30 million word gap, you've probably heard that, um, over the decades, thinking about the children who come from very low income versus working class versus moderate income families and the resources they have available to them and the availability for the parents in particular and whether it be their education or just the economics of the resources available to them and how that impacts their ability to convey their vocabulary, convey their education to their young children. And that resulting in this 30 million word gap between young children who have and have not um, in those early years. And what I reinforce is that 30 million word gap, that is something Hardin Risley put on. It's not necessarily, you don't focus on the 30 million. It's to reinforce the fact of the socioeconomic difference between young children and families who are socioeconomically disadvantaged versus those who have more. And that was the point of the video to start with. But it holds true. Even in the video you saw, on average, the research is very consistent that socioeconomic disadvantaged students start behind and fall further behind during those summer months. I emphasize something that in the video that didn't show quite as well is that during those nine months during the school year, the yes, they on average, even though children of lower economic status um, definitely are further behind than their peers, 
they grow at the same rate in terms of learning. During the summer, yes, the higher economic go further. But what happens, and the research is being more and more consistent, is that you can see on this slide, the summer learning loss actually grows wider and wider over time. And that's what I'm emphasizing in these circles. And that wasn't as clear in the video. And that is something that is important to know is not only do they fall behind, but the gap widens over time as well. And that's something that is important to note as well. This is another way of looking at that. Um, just in sh to reinforce the fact that summer reading loss widens the gap. On the left is the different is showing the consistency between the disadvantaged students and the better off students during the school year. But during the summer, you see the negative regression at, uh, on the left hand side for the children who are disadvantaged versus on the right hand side the great growth that happens with the additional resources that are afforded to them. So summer slide is an issue. And also, we know that um, we can do some things about that. So this um, quote that's on the screen is from an executive summary of a study that was looking at how we could leverage scaling and um, return on investment for summer programs. So I'll give you a minute to read that. But this is saying in that study, they looked at um, quite a few kids, over 6,000 students, and they looked at giving books that had comprehension lessons teachers had developed with them, as well as um, checking in. And for kids in low socioeconomically disadvantaged schools, it um, was much more beneficial for the check-in process, and for all kids, it was better to have the comprehension lessons um, following up with the books that the kids sent, were sent home with. So when we think about what kind of programs are happening and where we're putting those dollars um, to create a summer program, how that program's put together will matter, and it will matter in different ways for different families is, is what this study was looking at. We also know that not always are schools the ones putting together the additional time. So it might be a community member or a partner um, to the school, or it might be the school. So um, what we did was reach out to some researchers to scan all the literature and see how do we leverage that out of school time to support literacy. So these four um, bullets, including literacy as part of the learning, for example, if you were a school doing a summer program, that probably would be something you would do anyway. But if you're a partner, you may think it's just going to be great to get the kids together, which it would, but if we want to leverage literacy learning, we'd make sure that literacy was part of that time. Uh, you would recruit students who are at risk eligible, who are um, not yet demonstrating grade level <laughs> literacy skills. So we want to target students who really need that literacy learning. Um, encouraging regular attendance. Richard will speak a little bit to that. Um, it's important that if kids sign up, they come, that, or that they're able to come. And then provide explicit instruction that can be individualized. So leveraging that time with students to make sure they're getting their needs met. So we'll have a um, practitioner brief on this that we'll share with schools um, so that if they're thinking about their out of school time and summer programs right now, they'll have some time to think about how to make, make it the best um, use of time. MDE does offer some out-of-school programs, or we have some um, opportunities. These are a few of them, 21st Century Community Learning Centers, um, access to Michigan e-library resources, those are within our purview, um, school and year-round library program, we have the Library of Michigan connected to, with um, MDE, and our Meet Up, Eat Up, and Read Up program. So we'll talk a little bit about each of these just to give you a flavor of what the possibilities are. And thinking about funding, of course, we do flow funding from um, the state budget. And there are quite a few sources available, um, bigger pots of money, like Title I and 31A funding for at-risk students. And I didn't put it on the slide, but we have some early literacy funding for summer programs. But um, 
providing a list of where there's small pots of money is still not going to take care of the problem because schools have so many demands on those pots of money and how they're stretching them out. For example, our summer school program yielded about $109 per student who was uh, based on the numbers of students who weren't being proficient on the M-STEP. If you're looking at kids who aren't proficient on the M-STEP, $100 per kid for a summer program probably isn't going to go super far, but it's better than not having any. Um, so the message of that story is we still need more funding to support um, out-of-school programming to uh, leverage that learning for literacy. So one of our programs that we, a larger program in the department that is funded under Title IV, Part B, um, is the 21st Century Community Learning Centers program. Uh, we presented it a couple times over the years to the state board. And this program is a competitive grant. It goes to a wide variety of grantees throughout the state, districts, intermediate districts, public school academies, community-based partners, um, some institutes of higher ed. Um, in the past, it's been faith-based as well as um, local governments. So we've had a variety of grantees over the years. But one thing related to our programming and thinking about literacy and um, impact on academics, the 21st Century Community Learning Centers, we've been evaluating this program since 2001 um, in Michigan from a, a statewide evaluation point of view. and so. What you have here are some of the research findings that we've been able to focus on related to literacy in particular. Um, also, we find in mathematics as well, um, impacts as well. But some are learning loss, yes, was evident in students with no access to the program in terms of the 21st century model that we provide um, in Michigan has uh, a 32 weeks during the school year and six weeks during the, the summer. Um, and we have it as a six-week clump and so it's not broken up. Um, so there's continuous uh, exposure and intensity and dosage. And that gets to uh, the point um, that you'll see up here in terms of attendance matters, enrollment matters. And um, that is reinforced in the literature, uh, exposure to the content matters. But you know, having uh, one of the things in terms of thinking about um, programming, you know, when you think about Monday through Friday or Monday through Thursday and worrying about Thursday and Fridays in particular, maybe you put your high, more high value programming on those days. You think about the staffing structure for those days because um, it's harder to necessarily, you know, these are some of the strategies that we need to put into place to ensure that children get to the programs on those days in order to ensure that the appropriate dosage, because dosage matters in terms of academics. Uh, one of the most recent studies that has been done is showing that um, in order to actually get academic outcomes in ELA and math, there's a minimum threshold of exposure of hours and days. And it averages on average between 24 and 35. And so given that, you know, we have a model in Michigan that falls within that. And that's ultimately what we base our model on. And so when school districts may have something less than that and they don't necessarily see an, a boost, it's something that we are going to start working on to promote greater awareness around because the research is now starting to solidify around the dosage and attendance issue. 24 but, to 35 hours over the summer? Hours within the content areas, yes. And I'll be able to share. Over that. the summer? Over the summer specifically, yes. And you said, I'm, I'm not sure that was fully understood. There was a specific number of days that you noted previously yes. um, for a summer days, program. 30 days. 30 days um, in the summer helps beat back the summer slide. Yes. OK. And then within the content areas, uh, there's additional studies focusing on content within ELA and math that have emerged as well within specific dosage of content, if you so want. it's not it. just 30 days worth of dosage. It's, there's sort of a micro dosage within the larger dosage. Correct. Within the days, there's number of hours associated with math, associated with ELA. 
and all of this is from a, a, a out of school time perspective. This is academic enrichment. It's not necessary replication of what is done traditionally with it within a school day um, academic mode. It's teaching standards, the Michigan standards academically within a, a, in an enrichment format, thinking about new ways of teaching, uh, not new ways, but different ways of reinforcing the, the, the learning of geometry and math and, uh, and literacy within uh, enrichment activities of theater and arts and geo mapping and treasure hunting and robotics and different ways that engage children in learning through an out of school time modality. So back to sorry, back to the um, 21st century evaluation and research. Um, what we have found in particular in the most recent years, since 2014, um, just to reinforce some of these pieces, we have found that almost half of our at-risk participants that participate uh, improved ELA uh, grades while attending our programs regularly. Um, and about one third of those participants improved ELA when you have access specifically to those qual quality summer programs. Um, and so 21st century is funded at a building level. And so, and that's the differentiation between the at-risk because not all the children in the building are deemed at-risk. And so all children have access to the program within the building. Um, so ultimately, again, reinforcing the program attendance matters, and that's one of the key elements to outcomes. So just a couple um, points of pride about the library in Michigan. They have the e-library, so I'm, I'm pretty sure some of you have heard of that before, and there's a, quite a few e-resources that are available. And this slide is showing the usage of those um, programs. So Britannica School, think Encyclopedia Britannica, just more interactive um, and up-to-date, right? Um, I, it, Encyclopedia Britannica is probably not up-to-date, <laughs> <laughs> the book one. Novelist K8 is a um, free online books. Opposing viewpoints in context, um, articles that address a, a topic by a couple different um, viewpoints, and then World Book Kids are just some of the programs that would uh, work in our K-12 community across the, the grades. And you can see um, the usage. The thing with these great programs, they're free to Michigan residents. They're not free, but they're free to Michigan residents, but they're only um, as useful as they are used. So we want to encourage that um, kids can use these on um, devices, phones, computers, um, if, if they know that they're there. So that's one of the things that um, is available all year round. And then if we look at just the public libraries, um, this is just an excerpt of, of some of the numbers about the library programming and attendance. So while the library programs have increased, participation over the years is somewhat flat um, or in some spaces decreased. And so what that says to us is we know those are high quality programs that folks have access to free of charge. And we need to encourage participation and also how to increase, you know, encourage ways to increase access to those programs as well. So when libraries partner with schools, that's one way. When communities partner with libraries, that's another way. When they um, all merge together, that, you know, just thinking creatively about how do we get kids to use these programs that already exist that we know are high quality and we know are built to leverage literacy. Eat up, meet up, read up. The eat up and meet ups exist in many more places. So sp spaces where um, um, communities offer to have a site where people can get fed, where students can get fed over the summer is great. If we can find ways to leverage the literacy opportunities within that, it's wonderful. So these are just a few spaces where that, just a few numbers of where that happened in summer 2019. So you can see there were a total of uh, 1,756 sites. 50 of those were at libraries, a great way to leverage that great programming, and um, over three, 3 million meals served. So that's just kind of statewide. We don't have a lot of data on what happens at those specific programs um, statewide because it's all very contextual. Depending on where the site is and what's happening, um, 
some sites give out books, some sites are doing programming or an activity that lends to literacy learning, but it would be very difficult to capture that. Um, so we do have this data from Detroit. So the libraries in 2019 not across nine locations coordinated with the summer reading um, program activities, another great way to leverage different opportunities, and they were able to serve almost 6,000 healthy lunches to kids. So that's one way we can capture that and share it. Um, but really the message there is how do you look at programs that might fit together nicely over the summer to offer both high quality literacy learning opportunities and maybe there's something else. But in this case, it's food. And with that said, we're just gonna kind of leave you on the note of thinking about all of the opportunities that we have here at MDE or maybe other opportunities, um, as well as funding and what we know works best when trying to make that out of time, school time um, leverage its way for literacy learning. Anybody else have me? Thank you very That's much right. to our presenters, uh, board members, uh, questions or comments, Ms. Snyder. Just, this is great overall. I just want to ask you about questions about page three. So just really determining hours out of school. When I see 91%, I'm like, oh, cow, that's a lot of hours. And then I'm realizing kids need to sleep. So like nine to 14 hours. Is, does that, is that built into this number? Oh, it's all hours. It's all within hours. a 24 hour. Yeah. So imagine you, yeah. I'd just be concerned with presenting that to parents because you're like, whoa, what am I doing with my time? 91% <laughs> of the hours are out of school. Like, you know what I'm saying? Just, I don't know, kind of maximizing really what, what the realistic expectation is. Um, but yeah, of course, out of school hours are very important. Um, but you need sleep too. I was just going to suggest there's this uh, library resource through... Um, Institute of Museum and Library Services, which I think is available through local public libraries, but if they're not in connection or in tune with it, maybe it's you guys would be a good hub for that resource. It's called texttolearn.com. So for parents, they, it will text them developmental milestones, ways that they can sing, play, write, learn with their kids on the go, if you will. So it's not just about transportation, but you know, parents that are working, it's just, I don't know, I get the text and it's like, oh, that's a great idea. So implement it in your day or week as you go along. So lots of really good um, at your fingertips, very little resource required, engage with your child type of ideas. Thank you very much. Other, uh, other thoughts, reflections? Um, Ms. Fecto, Dr. Pugh. So, go ahead. Oh, Mine yeah. is just... Look like a jump ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, just uh, uh, pretty quick. Um, I wrote it down, so I wouldn't forget it. Um, uh, what's the uh, the uh, website um, for getting on the Michigan e Library? Is it on here? Do you have Mel Mel dot org and the L dot org. Okay, and then I also just wondering about <clears throat> promoting um, school uh, librarians in schools, because there's been you know a number of studies that support having a certified librarian in the school who can keep things up to date and. You know, engage with students, and I didn't really hear any of that. Maybe it's because it's considered a local district priority, but yeah, and a lot of our schools are losing their school librarians, um, right. which is unfortunate. So sometimes when we speak about that, um, it gets people's ire up of, oh, well, my school lost their school librarian. But I, I know for the literacy end, I work very closely with MAME, which is the Michigan Association right. of Media, um, and. Um, We've even worked on how, how do we make sure that it's communicated well, that um, school librarians are supporting the essentials, where are the leverage points, that sort of thing. So do either of you want to address? No, it's hard to argue the importance of them. Obviously, they're right. extremely, extremely important. Yeah, and so is there anything to do to promote them or to have that be part of the, I mean, I don't know, I know the coaching. I, I, it just seems like because there's <clears> such a direct link to having them and increasing literacy that it seems, and then also smaller class sizes in the lower grades, but these things don't always get discussed. I would be happy being, to lift to MAME the idea of thinking about how they them, their role as school librarians might help leverage the out-of-school time. You know, what does that mean? How, how might they support? I'm sure they'd have lots of ideas on how they could right. I want to get them. more of them. That's what I'm... And we can I don't know how we can encourage Randy. schools yeah. or look for a way, maybe if we get that funding, um, because if we really are serious about literacy, this is 
a direct connection to literacy. So that was Thank my point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pugh. And I hope I didn't miss part of the answers to Michelle's questions, but <laughs> mine was around the 21st century and is very simple because this was an assignment that I had and that was around the grant opportunities because yes. I have not seen that the RFP has come out. And so I was being asked, is that going to happen this year? For the actual programming grants? Yes. So the 21st Century Community Learning Centers, we operate on five-year grant cycles okay. and three cohorts. Okay. So we take two years off every couple of years. And so we are in those paused years. Okay. So the next grant cycle for actual programming grant, <laughs> it will come out in 2021. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, That's Stacey. Helpful. And and so that people are um, are following the conversation that Dr. Pugh started. These are federal dollars that flow through states for the administration thereof. 21st century after school and summer programming grants. Correct. Okay. Um, so uh, one could argue. I would argue that there are insufficient dollars to go around and that we regularly have twice, three times the number of applicants relative to the winners of those, um, those grants. There are communities across the state that would love to have those dollars for after school programming for their, for their young people. I know that's the case in Saginaw, it's certainly in the case in, in many other communities as well. Federal dollars administered by the states, Title IV, Part B, um, federal. I have one question, Please. and yeah, that yeah. was good. Um, and thank you. When when does the RFP come out? If if, if you're saying they're due in 2021, no, that's or? when the RFP, the RFP will, will come, come out. out. Okay. Right. Typically in late January so. of 2021. Time. Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you. Other questions or thoughts on this area of out of school time? Okay, three other points. Uh, Dr. Bugney mentioned um, James Kim's research. Uh, important to understand that this research is sending a book to a child every week and a half or two weeks in the summer. That's the dose, if you will. It's sent directly to the child's home. It is a book of his or her choosing at roughly his or her grade level. Child reads the book, child sends a postcard back to a teacher, teacher sends a postcard back to the child. That those postcards are related to the program effect. It's not simply giving a child a book, it's not simply the book of the child's choosing, it's the book being sent to the child, not a bag of books given to the kid, not one book given to the kid, not a book um, uh, of any sort, but a book that is of interest, engaging to the child, sent to the child's home. And then there's that dialogue that gets fostered through the postcards. And Kim proved over a period of time with his research that that dialogue is necessary for that positive program effect for beating back that summer, um, that summer slide. There are superintendents that have um, used James Kim's research to, um, to work to beat back the slide in their districts. I know one fairly well. Two research briefs in process. Uh, Dr. Bugney mentioned one of them, the out of school time research brief that we're putting together. Another one is a summer literacy research brief. By brief, we're not talking about magnum opuses. We're talking about small. Uh, you can click on the links to review the research in all its glory if you have an interest. But other than that, here are the couple three pages that can have a big impact on out of school learning time for your young people. Recognize that so much of the time that kids uh, uh, in kids' lives are out of school. But we ought not to concede our ability to affect those hours. We ought to try to get into those hours, recognizing that there are many tugs on that time. I respect that, OK? But there also should be a little bit of time for reading. I used to tell my, my, um, my rocket football coaches and, and, and basketball coaches, baseball coaches, I said, you know, two and a half hours 
they're practicing, you can figure out how to get in 30 minutes of reading in that. Come on now. Um, work, work with me. And they, and they did in a number of cases. And then the only other point is that if you look at the statistics that, um, that our presenters share, that, that Richard Lauer shared, that Brandy Bugney shared, you'll notice that while the programming in public libraries is up, that the participation rates are slightly down. And we have to be about boosting those participation rates. We can't concede the summer, particularly for working class and poor kids who have limited exposure on average relative to their middle class peers to text. We cannot concede a summer. We can't concede 11, 11 and a half weeks of summer. We have to be about trying to get something out of, that, um, out of that summer. If no one has anything else on this subject, it is 12.07, and we will reconvene at 1.07.